Good evening. I'd like to call to order this, the regular town council meeting for Tuesday, October 12, 2021. Please rise for a moment of silence. We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, good evening, everyone. Fishbein? Here. Laffin? Here. Marone? Here. Morgenstein? Here. Shortell? Tata? Here. Testa? Here. Zandri? Here. And Chairman Cervoni? Here. I suspect Councillor Shortell will arrive any moment. Or, yes, yeah, certainly before we get to item seven on the agenda. I got it. I have a motion on the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve or accept consent agenda items A through E. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda passed. Item four, uh, there are no items removed from the consent agenda. Uh, item five, the public question and answer period. Councilor Marone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we get to that, um, I'd like to add an, endem, an item to the agenda tonight uh, by waiving Rule 5, or make a motion to waive Rule 5 to add an item to the agenda. Second. The, the item is... Uh, Can we hear what the... Uh, I'm going to do it just for the heck of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, discussion and possible action on the uh, Wallace parking lot. Now uh, I'll what, second it. What possible action could there be on the Wallace Avenue parking lot? Well, so we received some communication that the, the reason we're not moving forward with the lot uh, is because the bids came in too high. So I think what we would do is potentially move money around or uh, potentially a resolution um, to allow money to be moved around to get the parking lot completed. So the charter requires any uh, budget amendments during the term to come from the administration. If there's no budget amendment proposed by the administration to deal with the issue, then that's not legal action. So it would seem, Mr. Chairman, that we're debating an issue, though, that hasn't been added to the agenda yet. Well, that is correct, because I'm debating the propriety of adding the item to the agenda. See, Rule 5 says subsequent business not included on the agenda may be discussed and acted upon on affirmative vote of a two-thirds majority. Um, I, I don't see how we can legally act upon the item. So I'm not so sure that it's appropriate for the r r Wave Rule 5. I'm not sure the motion is in order. Um, so uh, respectfully, Mr. Chairman, on the, uh, the dog pound issue, uh, we did have a resolution to appropriate the money or allow the option to appropriate the money to the administration. That is a completely different issue because that money is not part of the budget and is completely within our purview. Point of order. Councilor Testa. Would not um, an agenda item can simply be a discussion of something. We've done that before where we just want to report from the administration. So we could add an agenda item if it was worded as such or a discussion of whatever the subject matter is. Is that not appropriate? That is appropriate, but when we're looking for discussion from the administration, we are typically giving them the courtesy of knowing in advance what we're going to talk about. So we don't, we don't necessarily have department, individual department heads here prepared to discuss the issue. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Fishbein. Um, I note that one of the items that is on our agenda tonight, I believe it's the last item, I have absolutely no idea based upon the backup. It talks about recreation at Tyler Mill. 
Yeah, we have recreation at Tyler Mill. We're talking about hunting, fishing, hiking. No idea. Thank you, so Councillor Fishbein. That was timely submitted before the agenda was set. Okay, I just I just heard that the qualification for an item would be so that we knew what we were talking about, so that people could be here to address it. No member of the public has any idea, I don't think, what that particular item is, is about. So, um, but Mr. Chairman, I understand uh, how you've ruled on the, the motion, and I would appeal the ruling of the chair. There's a motion to appeal the ruling of the chair. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, I, I when the parking lots came before us, originally it was represented to us about a progression. Now you're discussing the merit of the item to be added. Yes. So, yeah. therefore, which you, you had already engaged in, so it would be going to the ruling of the chair. You've determined, based upon the, the content of the motion, that it is inappropriate to come before the body. Therefore, to overrule the ruling of the chair, I think there has to be some establishment as to why it would be appropriate for that matter to come before the body, therefore calling for an overruling of the chair. So, may I continue or? Sure. Thank you. So, um, you know, the parking lots are of importance to myself and I know many of us. I believe the night, January 12th, that we dealt with this, we. We actually split the vote. Uh, the vote was, uh, the body approved uh, both of the lots by different votes. Um, I think we were taken, I, I know at least I was taken aback by a correspondence last week indicating that the Wallace lot is not going to get done um, this year. That's anticipated. Um, I've received a lot of communication about disappointment about that, and I think it's appropriate for this body to deal with it, and I think that um, it would be appropriate for us to deal with it tonight. So thank you. If there's no further discussion, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? This is on the appeal of the chair, the chair's uh, order, <coughs> ruling rather. Just to, be, just to be clear, it's yes to overrule, correct? That's correct. Okay, I vote yes. Laffin? No. Marone? Yes. Morgenstein. I just have a question. So we're voting to overrule the chair and waive rule five? No, just to just overrule to the chair. Overrule the chair. Um no. Shortel? Yes. Tata. Yes. Testa. What am I overruling? Not entertaining the waive rule five. Well, not, not entertaining it. That's so correct. you won't allow the motion to go to a vote. That's correct. Okay. Well, then I vote yes to overrule that. Thank you. Sandry? Yes. And Chairman Cervoni? I vote no, but the motion to overrule my ruling passes. Therefore, going back to the waive rule five, uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll on Councillor Marone's motion to waive Rule 5 to discuss the Wallace Avenue parking lot? Fishbein? Yes. Laffin? No. Marone? Yes. Morgenstein? Is his motion still discuss and possible action, or is it just discuss? I believe he said and possible action. No. Shortel? Yes. Tata? Yes. Testa? Well, just again, for clarification purposes, is anytime there's a discussion, there's opportunity for possible action. Once an item is on the table, we're talking about it, anybody can make a motion. So all agenda items that say discussion by default include possibility of action. And I will vote yes. Zandri? Yes. Chairman Cervoni? Uh, no. The vote is 6-3. The agenda is amended. Mm. 
What do we think about that? Uh, we might as well proceed with the item. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, on Tuesday, last Tuesday, we received a notification that the parking lot wasn't going to go forward um, because the bids came in higher than anticipated. So I guess my concern was when we initially discussed this item uh, a ways back, um, it was represented by the administration that the, the two parking lots needed to be bid together uh, or that they were going to be, we needed to approve both of those items together. Uh, in fact, the mayor said five or six times during the meeting that this is not going to go piecemeal, this is one project. So then ultimately we approve, you know, you know, we took X and we split it into Y and Z. Then we approved Y and Z, which was both the Simpson lot and the Wallace lot. Um, the Simpson lot was went out to bid, I believe, at some point in April, uh, and that is either done or largely completed. Uh, the Wallace lot didn't go out to bid until September, uh, and so my concern is we're getting near the end of the paving season. And if we haven't awarded a bid yet because we're concerned on the price, I'm not sure when, if ever, it's going to get done. Uh, so I guess my question to the administration is what's the plan going forward with the Wallace lot, um, and how did they get separated at this juncture? Well, I think as my note mentioned to each of the council members, uh, we would look to bid it in the spring. My opinion is it's still one project. Uh, one part was done in... Uh, in part of the fiscal year, the next part in the second half of the fiscal year. Uh, both need to be paved and improved and fully intend to do that. But given the bids that came in um, and given the time period we are dealing with, with uh, prices unpredictable and much higher than normal, uh, it would be appropriate to rebid it and uh, hopefully have better prices, but regardless, we, we will do it because as I indicated, administratively, it was one project. We weren't gonna do one or the other, we are going to do both. But in the interest of taxpayers and trying to do the best we can with, with uh, getting reasonable prices, uh, the option to rebid it, I think, is appropriate given what we experienced with the uh, lowest bid. would make us think that we would get a cheaper bid in the spring as opposed to now. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, my question is, what would lead us to believe that we would get a, uh, a less expensive bid in the spring as opposed to now? Well, I think the expectation, and it certainly may not turn out to be true, but the expectation that the supply lines, the issues we're finding, uh, even with buying paint for lining of fields, um, materials are just not available. So we're, we're scrambling for a number of things and uh, everyone, I, not everyone, but certainly the expectation is that as the economies uh, readjust and uh, supply lines are reestablished, we should be in a better position to acquire the raw materials and, and uh, the, the, uh, oh, the, the, the work bid, the labor bid, necessary in order to accomplish the task. Now, is the Simpson lot completed 100%? My understanding is it's completed, yes. So um, I, I noticed in the budget, uh, or in the, the monthly report, I think we have $114,000 still in the Simpson account. Does that sound about right? Uh, I believe there is extra money. I don't know the exact amount at this point, but there is extra money there. Okay. And certainly that could be accessed uh, once we have uh, another bid, but I, I don't believe that that by itself was enough to cover the difference in um, in what the bids were. Okay, um, I think 114 was the number I saw, Mr. Sen. Is that does that sound about right? I, I I'm not. Oh, Jim. I don't have the report in front of me, but it sounds about right. Yes. Okay. Okay. So so the amount that you had represented in your memo was we were short by about 100,000. So I guess my concern is we could rebid it in the spring. We could get get a higher bid. Right, so it's it's sort of a you know there's a, a risk involved. Certainly with the the pandemic and so on, prices have been fluctuating pretty dramatically. Uh, but but I think the expectation is things will settle down. Right now, it is extremely volatile. Um, again, I'm I've, as I indicated, we want to do that job, and we will we will abide by what the results are with the bid next spring. But I think in the interest of 
of our due diligence to to uh, rebid it is certainly reasonable under the circumstances, and our efforts to protect public money and, and do things in a responsible way. Right now, it's like I say, the, the paint for the fields is a perfect example. So initially, I wasn't under the impression, certainly, that we were going to that these when we were splitting the projects that that meant one was going to be done immediately and one was going to be done, you know, five or six months later. So why was the decision made to hold off the one bid till September? Well, that, that comes down to the workload of, of the departments. In part, I think initially, Public Works was intending to do it. Uh, since that time, they discovered that they cannot keep up with their other duties. They're going into a major paving in the next couple of weeks, and they were not able to accomplish what they had initially expected to uh, perform. So that meant a public bid had to go out engineering accomplished that and we received the results but there was a shift as a result of the, the uh, volume of work necessary for public works now a, a public bid was made on the simpson lot as well for the paving correct that's correct okay so the work involved in one would have been the same essentially for the other project correct well I, the type of work is similar but it's not the, exactly the same it's a different size it's it's uh i believe uh I, I don't know all of the nuances. I, I, I'm, I believe it's a larger size or some concrete curbing and things of that kind that have to go in with, on the Wallace Avenue. So it's not exactly the same, hence there is a different price tag uh, has been all along assigned to each of those projects. Now I did note that some of the contractors uh, that put in bids had noted that they couldn't do the work until 22. Why not award the bid now and lock in a price as opposed to, um, you, you know, rolling the dice on that the, the economy will improve or that the, the prices will come down in the spring? Well, so, so we accept what we think is a high bid. Why? Why, why wouldn't we be willing to rebid it? I guess I'm not sure how you come up with the conclusion that it's a high bid. So if you have five bids and they're all essentially in the same ballpark, that would seem to me that that's sort of the market value of that job. Well, the market value may be right now, but if things get better, as I'm certainly hoping they will, it may not be. We're, we're talking about you know maybe six months from now. Um, why, why would we want to go with bids that we know are received in a very volatile time period? Because I guess what guarantee do we have that the time period is not volatile in the spring? I mean, they're talking about you know additional uh, masking requirements and so on. So anything could happen between now and then. Uh, oh, so and I, but it comes back to the. I guess my concern is it comes back to the. This was represented that this was all one project, right? And, and with the idea that this was all going to be performed timely. Uh, th no, there you're separating things. Who said it was one project? You're looking at him. Right. It was an effort to make it two projects by the council. I said from the beginning, this is one project. If one parking lot's to be done, then the other parking lot has to be done. The financing of it became two projects. But that's one project as far as I'm concerned. So part of it has been finished. One half of the project is finished. We have the other half to go. So let's not talk about how it's become two projects. It's not two projects. It's one project. So that has not changed administratively from the beginning to right now. I understand, I understand the words. I don't understand how you could not consider this two projects, considering that the council split, you were very upset when we did, and then now we're completing them in two completely different years. It's not two completely different years. Calendar years, but it's the same fiscal year. So if there's a will to do it, we will do it. But I have a hard time looking at bids that I consider high and going right ahead with it, ignoring what I think are you know, tough economic times. And we know it's tough times now. May it be, it, might it be difficult in another six months? It could be, but it also may be less. I think given, given what we've experienced, it's worth waiting that short amount of time. It's not a lot of time at all. I respectfully disagree on the on the time frame and on the the
desire to separate this into two separate issues. Um, but, but I'll yield for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Laffin. Thank you. Um, I, I do think this is worth the report out or the discussion. Um, the, the tying it to the action thing, and, and contrary to what Councilor Testa said, I feel though we always, we state whether we are gonna take action. Um, and, I, and we think we, we are always and we should be careful with taking action without, without proper notice. Uh, so it's uncomfortable that. The, the, the other issue I have though is the timing of this. Usually when we waive rule five, it's something urgent. Um, snow removal or something that we need to like move money around and it's something kind of quick and easy that everybody agrees on. Um, the, and I want to clear up though, the Council Marone, you said that the project, we weren't going forward, but the, the memo says that they are rebidding in the spring. So, and, and as the mayor then stated, I think we're just doing it in a different order, right? Right, so, so to address the timing issue, the timing issue is that the paving season is finite and it's gonna end shortly, right? So that would be the end of when it could possibly get done in this, in this calendar year. Right, we don't have any authority to approve the project or the bid. Well, no, the project's already approved, right? The, and we have the bids, so the- but we don't have the authority to give the go on the, on the paper. Right, but the, the mayor could request the additional funds are shifted over from the Simpson lot funds. So we already have the money set aside in a similar account, it's one project, right? So in the, the two accounts we have set up for the one project, we already have the money set aside. We can't pull that trigger. Your point being what, sir? That's, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, so I talked to you know, department heads about this and everything, and they are fully committed and going forward. They're reworking it, They're, they'll probably move money. I don't know, there's leftover money from the other account which you brought up. I just feel like that this was all gonna kind of happen anyway. So, and it may happen anyway, you know, but so for example, the Brothers lot, which we approved in December of 2020, still has been paved, right? So that's two paving projects that we're behind now, and one, you know, by a year. So I don't know that I would look at anything as a, as a guarantee that the work gets done. That's why I decided to make this inquiry. Okay. Good. Councilor Zandri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do we have an example, I'd like to ask the controller, the controller, or even the mayor, do we have an example of, of any time in our history where we've delayed a project and we've saved money? Off the top of my head, I, I can't give you an example, but I believe it would happen. The economy goes through swings all the time. Um, now we're, we're an upward swing. Oil's going up and everything else. It was going down for a long period of time. Projects were coming in cheaper, I believe, especially after 2008. But, you know, I, off the top of my head right now, I'm not going to know a specific. Well, and, and I appreciate the response because historically, with anybody, I don't care whether it's a municipality or a business or anything for that matter, you never see a benefit by waiting. Labor goes up, materials go up. Now I acknowledge that paving materials and paint and things are in short supply, but when you're talking about petroleum products, like the, the, the content of the material that goes down in paving, um, goes up and down with the, the price of oil, you're, you're gonna be subject to that. And then the worst part is that when you're dealing with What if it's a, 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 a bad winter and we're plying, plowing that gravel lot and we end up tearing up a lot of the lot because it's gravel and it's not pavement? Then we might have to do a lot more resurfacing before we actually put the pavement down. Wallace, Par Wallace parking lot over there on the Wooden Kaplan property has been discussed for more than 10 years. When we, when we originally discussed it, and I was one of the people that brought up the original cost to pave that lot with a temporary one inch skim coat pavement, it was $30,000, 30,000. 
that would have lasted about 10 years. That was 10 years ago. So we could have had at least a, a paved surface rather than the surface that we've got today. Uh, I was one of the people that was up here when we were discussing both of these lots that did want to split these projects. I'll own up to that right now because I felt the only work we should be doing on the private property lot, which is Simpson Court, was to take our responsibility as the town after 25, 30, however many years we were there and restore the used area to the condition we found it. We should have been maintaining it the whole time. This bundled project for that lot on Simpson Court side was expanded and it was almost like a poison pill. There was no way that we would do the extra work on that lot and then walk away from it. So we had to approve it that way. And then we basically tied the parking lot across the street to it. So I, I want to see this done. I, I, don't, I am not talking about let's just spend the taxpayer money all willy-nilly and not try to save thirty dollars or $40,000 on a new bid. It's a dice roll and it's a gamble to try to do it again in the spring. It, the, the demand could be just as bad. Oil prices could be just as high. Labor could be just as tough. We have already taxed the people on this lot over there. It was all built into the budget that got passed. There's money left over from the Simpson paving job. The almost to the to the dollar the amount we need. 114 left, 100,000 more short. Already taxed. Taxes are not going to go up if we move that money over and do this lot. There's money in contingency. The budget closed from last year in June. We don't get the final numbers to the end of the year. It'll probably be 20 times the $100,000 we're short. There's no reason to not do this project now. I, I don't want to rush to do it just to get it done, but there's no reason to stop it because the bids came in high. The bids came in all relative to one another, and we didn't even take the lowest bid. We took the lowest qualifying bid, which was a little higher than the lowest one. But I really think that we should be moving this forward. And if it's a matter of making a motion to move the money over from one account to the other, if that's something we can do, we should do it. The administration still has the option, I suppose, because they're the only one that can execute anything, to not do the work and rebid it in the spring. And maybe if it does come in ten dollars or $20,000 cheaper, we're all wrong. But if it comes out twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more and we didn't take any action, then we're still wrong because we didn't bring it up to discuss. Um, this has been a long conversation over the, over the years about that lot, and I don't think it's worth the gamble to wait until the springtime, because then what's the, what if it's 30000 more? Are we going to suddenly do it then? Well, you know, we tried. We rolled the dice. It's thirty grand more. We, we like to be fiscally responsible with the tax dollars, but we said we'd do it. No, nah, it'll, it'll get deferred and delayed again. That's just my thought. I won't be sitting up here at the time, but I'm going to be sitting over there, and that'll be the question I'll have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my recollection, and again, if I'm misrepresenting anything, please correct me. My recollection was that when we talked about this, uh, it was presented to us that Public Works would handle the wooding paving job and the Simpson job would be, would be bid out. And when I was brought to my attention that we bid out the job for wooding, the wooding lot, I, I asked some department heads about it. And I was told, <clears throat> you know, the, the Simpson project came in lower than we had thought, which is great. Everybody was pleased with that. Cost less than we anticipated. And the decision was made, you know, if we're getting such a good deal, if we just got such a good deal on the Simpson lot, let's throw the bid out on the wooding just for the heck of it. So we have something to compare. And if it doesn't come in right, Public Works will just do it anyway. And that was how it was explained to me by the people that are involved in this. And it made sense to me. It actually seemed responsible. So now we're told the bid came in about $100,000 over what was expected. So my first question is, what, over what? 
In other words, what's the base cost that we're saying we exceeded, and how was that determined in the first place? The amount that was appropriated was $77,000 for the Wallace area. Based on what? It was the amount discussed at the meeting, the, the action was taken. Uh, actually, it was supposed to be one lump sum for all the lots, but uh, things got discussed. It ended up with something over 300000 for for um, the Simpson area and 77000 for Wallace. And uh, when it came time for Public Works to be able to do it, they, they were not in a position to do it, as I stated. I got now they're down 25 percent due to workers' comp and people, pe some people retiring. Um, 25 percent of their manpower is down, and they've got a lot of work on their table, so they couldn't do it. And at that point, the decision was made, well, let's go out to bid and see if we can do it. See, that's, what wasn't, that's not what was presented to me, though. Well, that's I wasn't, what was told to me by employees okay. who report to me. So okay. I don't know who you heard from, but that's, that's well, what I was people. told. The, the, they uh, explained that, it, you know, they figured, hey, maybe, you know, maybe they, I mean, they don't, they don't report to me, so they don't have to tell me everything. I understand that. Uh, I'm not saying that that's not true. Um, but I'm just saying how it was represented to me. And I have no argument with the fact that the Public Works Department makes a determination based on their manpower, based on workload. You know what, this is not something we can pull off right now. So let's go with the bid. But lo and behold, we don't go with the bid. Now, when I said, I asked, where did the original number come from? You said, we approved it. Well, come on, we approve what we're told. They give us the number. And you right. said- that, yeah. was, that was the figure left after money was appropriated, appropriated for Simpson. There was no indication that that was an insufficient amount of money. Right by the departments or anyone else. So 77,000 was appropriated. Right. It turns in it's over $200,000 for it. So I'm a little concerned about what causes a bid to be that high over what was felt to be adequate, at least I assumed it was adequate, at 77,000. But you yourself just said, um, the, we did try to separate it to two amounts, but we kind of still had a, a bundled number for the whole project. And it appears that the bundled number was right on the money. The bundled number seems to be right. Maybe the, the diff, maybe less for Simpson, more for Wooding, but the bundled number we all approved seemed to be right on the money within a few thousand dollars. So what, am I, I, I wrong? <laughs> we have 114 I, I, left I, I, over from Simpson, so the bundled money is still right. Let's get the job done. And that, that, that's where I'm a little lost. But my other question would be this. Because people said, you know, we... The Simpson project came in less than expected. What what is what was the material cost of this bid compared to what it ended up costing us at Simpson? Is it that much more? I don't know. I don't well, know. I'd inquire into the details. Okay, because that, to me that would seem to be the, 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 the you know the, the golden the golden ticket here. Um, the reason for bidding in the first place was that we got such a good deal on Simpson. Maybe we can get another good deal on Wooding because of the market, so if the, if the price per cubic yard or whatever, I haven't, I haven't bought asphalt in a while, is, is comparable, then the rationale would have been normal. Maybe the original estimate was just wrong because you were throwing a number together at the time. I'm just trying to figure out the real rationale for making that determination that it's too expensive, this bid was too high for the market. I don't, I'm not comfortable accepting we originally thought it'd be 77 because you yourself said we had a package for both lots. I just, I'm agreeing with my, my colleagues that, you know, we, we, uh, would, we, we approved this as one project, we tried to break it out and how much it would be for one, how much it would be for the other. We were never, we were never, we didn't really care about that. We didn't care how much it was going to be for one, how much for the other. We knew what the overall number would be to get the, and you, you yourself said, it's one project. Save on one, spend a little more on the other part. But one project comes in at one number, and it seems to me like the number's right where it was supposed to be. For the whole project, why are we, why are we hesitating? Well, uh, I've uh, explained my reasons. You don't like my reasons. I've explained them. 
Okay, I guess yeah, my last question was probably rhetorical. Okay. Um, and I just, I, I, think it, I think it's a mistake to not go forward and award this bid. Be, if, and, and maybe because I have a long memory on that property, um, I still have scars because of that property, and it just seems like, come hell or high water, we're never going to do that property. It's always going to be something that's going to stop us from paving that property. Because next three months from now, we're going to bid it, and then someone's going to say, hey, I, somebody wants to buy a part of that property and put a building up. Now we're not going to pave that property. Pave the damn property. I'm done. Thank you. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. So I would expect that when we sat down and looked at these project and we said one portion is going to be done by the town and another portion is going to be done by a private entity, anybody would think that the one that's being done by the town would be done at a cheaper price. At the point that the determination was made unilaterally to take that project that was anticipated to be done by the town is now going to go out to bid, one would logically think the number is going to go up. The 77 becomes a phantom becomes something more, and I don't have the expertise to give you that number, but to say, you know, it was so far over the 77,000 that we're just not going to do it this year, I just, I can't wrap my arms around it. You know, the urgency here is transparency at a certain level, because certainly I didn't know this was happening. I was concerned about the lots. My understanding was lots were going to be done to, together. One can certainly say that bidding this as one project would end up costing the taxpayers less in the end, less sitting here today. Because if one contractor had to transport asphalt and get a you know, work team and all of that stuff for both of these lots, probably going to cost you cheap. But now we potentially end up with a different bidder. And I have the bid documents. And it's interesting that with the Simpson Court project that was awarded, we look at the, the warranty. The warranty is one year to the bidder that got it. Well, that same bidder when they bid the Wallace project, they bid it a two-year warranty. So it begs the question, is the difference, I would think, that a portion of the, the increase double the warranty? So if we say that coming out of the box, that $77,000 is a phantom and really 110 maybe, because it's going out, and you say, well, I don't want a two-year warranty. I want a one-year warranty. The number's going to come down. You're going to be dealing with much smaller numbers. Because the project was not given to the lowest bidder. That's all of concern. But when we had the discussion on January 12th, and I, well, withdrawn, I'll go back a little bit. I like the lot at Simpson. I, 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 I've used it. Of course, I only use it when I go to places in Simpson Court, as I think that most people do. But I just think it looks like a lot, which I had said on January 12th, I, I didn't think would be sufficient. I wanted a lot that was inviting to our town, not just a lot. And I said, well, let's do period lighting. And I was told, well, we can't do that because it's already gone through planning and zoning and it's going to take more time and they've got to review a plan again. Well, this is our opportunity. You want Wallace Avenue lot to look good? You want it to be inviting? It's not going to get done until next year. That's what we're hearing. Add the period lighting. Go back to planning and zoning. Won't take that long. You want to do it right the first time to save some money? Let's do it right the first time to look good. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mayor, just a question about um, 
the bid in the future. Is there a possibility that Public Works would be able to do the work in the spring if we wait, or is it definitely going to go out to bid again? I, I can't make a judgment about whether they can in the spring or not. Uh, certainly that is a possibility. Uh, the only thing I can be fairly certain about is, you know, if I have any say in the matter, one way or another that, that lot will be uh, paved and, and completed. So uh, if, if it isn't rebid and Public Works is able to do it, that's, that's an avenue that can be broached. Right now the, the decision was to put it out to bid. Okay, but that option. The full intent is one way or another that is going to be completed. Okay. Um, but so that option is not off the table then. So if, if Public Works is able at that point and could do it for less money than what the, these current bids came in, that's still an option? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments from the public? Name and address for the record, please. Bill Casagrande, a Southview Drive. I have a couple of numbers here, and you can stop me any time because if I'm wrong, it was my understanding, and I was at that meeting, that in January, the town engineer said, we have $47,000 in our account to do this. We need another 375. And I believe that you approved that 375. Is that correct? As I sit here, I don't recall. Mr. Senna, do you have a perception or recollection? I wasn't at that meeting. Well, I'm, pretty, I'm fairly certain that you did. So that came to an amount of 422. Now, when the bid went out on March 21st for the Simpson lot, the cost of the, of the asphalt, the cost of the asphalt for the Simpson lot was $23.50 a cubic yard or square yard. A unit. I get mixed up with my cubics and my squares, but anyway. When this bid went out, the new bid that you got for the Wallace property, it came in at $18.63 for the tar. So $5 less for the material on the bid for the Wallace parking lot. So where we're coming in with the bid came in so high, the bid came in $5 lower for materials on the Wallace property than it did for the Simpson property. Now, according to my numbers, which I got from people that know, it wasn't 77,000, it was 88,000 that was appropriated for the Wallace property. And all the rest of that money was for the Simpson core property. When the engineer or whoever gets the bids got that bid of $23.50 for the asphalt per square yard, they must have said, wait a minute, we're never going to be able to pave Sims of Wallace property, which is 5,200 square feet, as opposed to 3,700 square feet for that amount of money. Just the cost of the materials is going to be too high. But nothing was said. So the project went along at Simpson. Simpson proper, project was completed for $177,000, far less than the 300 and something that had been in that account, as opposed to the 88 thousand that had been in the Wallace Avenue uh, parking lot. So there was all this money left, and yet it only came in at 177,000. That was the final bid. The bid for the Wallace property comes in at 194,000. That's five dollars for materials less than what we paid for Simpson. So the money has got to be there, and to me, it's just a matter of transferring those funds, which are still left in the account from Simpson. It's not that there's not money there. And if you get a bid and you agree to a bid of $23.50 for one parking lot, why in God's name would you not agree to a bid of $18.63 for the other lot? You're talking about it coming in less in the spring? It already has come in less, $5 less, $4.87 to be clear. Above and beyond all that, so this is all a, this is all a lot of it's going to be less in the spring. It may be less in the spring. It's already less in the spring. If you didn't think 2350 was too high, if you didn't think that was too high to do Simpson, why in God's name would you think that $18.63 for materials is too high for Wallace? 
It doesn't make any sense. You should grab it. In fact, if we bid both of them at once, we probably could have got them both done for $18.63 for the materials. So this is fiscal irresponsibility. And you're right, it probably never will get paid. We've had money sitting for two years for the brother's property. It's never been paid. Those are taxpayer dollars. And furthermore, I'm sitting here as a taxpayer saying somebody else's property got paved with my money. That's fine. A lot of people think it should have been paved. But now, my own property as a taxpayer can't get paved. I don't understand that. And I think it's up to the council to have a little courage and bid on, vote on this tonight and put it through. Because the money is there. The money is there. Thank you. Mr. Gross. Good evening, Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. I have to echo what Mr. Straczynski said, except I remember some numbers differently. I remember that night, I have them down here, that Attorney Fishbein made a motion to allocate 124000 for the Wallace lot. That's when the, um, that was combining because it's two lots over there. That's when the town engineer said there was 47000 previously allocated. So you lowered the number down to 77000 so there was 124,000 was the original number on that lot over there. That's from the minutes and so forth of that meeting. So I don't, so I don't know what these bids came in for. I didn't see them. Um, how much was it, Mr. Mayor? Do you know? Or somebody, somebody up in the council knows how much it was. I was told with contingency, the bid would come in at over $200,000. So it's less than 100,000. Difference because it was originally 124 according to what you were originally going to approve. But you don't know it's coming at that high. I'm just saying. And when did you originally go out to the bid for Simpson Court? Does anybody have the time frame? I assume it was last spring, but I, I don't. I don't have the exact time. And one of the reasons, in my opinion, that this lot got done so quickly. Um, and there was no period lighting because he didn't want to go back for it because he didn't want to take the time because when you voted on this in January, if people remember, that was pretty much the height of the pandemic in Connecticut. We had hundreds of people dying per week, 4,000 people a day dying in the United States. People did not want to come into contact with people. And that's when the, count, that's when the mayor brought this to the council after all those years at the height of the pandemic, knowing that a referendum would have been very difficult to do and let the will of the people decide whether these lots should have been done. And I don't, can't guarantee anything, but it should have been brought up to them because the numbers, Mayor, it's just bad planning on your part. You just wanted this lot through, in my opinion, and the other lots, so what? Thank you. All right, I don't see anybody else from the public coming forward. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. I forgot one thing. The, uh, what's it called? The American Rescue Plan. So if you don't have the money and the mayor doesn't want to approve the money for, out of the town budget, you can take this money from the Re American Rescue Plan, the mayor's going to say no, but you can, and you can allocate that money for those lots don't have to spend taxpayers' dollars on it, but they're technically taxpayer dollars, but they're not coming from the town. And the rationale behind that, and other communities are doing this, the town has set aside some area in Simpson Court for restaurants and taken away parking. You can make the argument very reasonably, because other communities have done it, that you're taking some of the American Rescue money to enhance these lots so people can park there to visit the restaurants or businesses in the downtown area. Mr. Mayor, you weren't listening. As you're aware, we're looking to hire a consultant to inform us accurately about what can and can't be done with funds such as the ARPA funds. Uh, that's that's where we'll, when and where we'll make the decision regarding what is allowable and what is not. Other communities are already going ahead and doing these things. The longer you wait, the more pain you're going to put on the local businesses, the quicker this money is spent. 
is the idea of it. That's why how, you've received millions of dollars already that you're just sitting on. It should be time to use some of that money for projects like this. Thank you. Councilor Zandri. Yeah, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to kind of call out the attention to some of the numbers since some of the costs were discussed by the, the members of the public that came up. With respect to Simpson Court, um, we had that cost of 2350 and I, I, I think it's um, square yard, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, but that's 3,700 units, whatever that is. It's not, I don't think it's square foot, I think it's square yard, but 3,700 units at $23.50 per unit price. When you consider the same cost over at Wallace for 5,200 units at 1863, the differential in the price goes from 86,000 to 96,000. So for, for a size area with almost 2,000 units more, uh, it's 1,800 units more, it's basically a $10,000 differential. This job, uh, the, 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 the group that got it, um, they basically said in, in their bid spec here, the bid, that they could get this done in 45 days based on uh, being uh, awarded the bid. So that lot can be done, the lot can be finished. And like we've already kind of said, when the whole project is looked at one project, we're not going outside the money. There's money left over for the Wallace side of the project, and then there's all the funds that are still sitting in the Simpson Court side of this one project. And we're talking about not doing it to save it, save, save some money that, to rebid it in the spring. The only way we might save it is if Public Works can do it, because then it's in-house. I'll remind the public as well that we had an opportunity since the, since the whole discussion point came up about COVID to do community pool on, on a bid that we had. It was locked in during the middle of a pandemic when people were starved for work. That $7 million project will never, ever come in at $7 million again. So I'm... I'm real uncomfortable with this entire idea of waiting. We are not spending additional dollars. We are spending dollars already allocated. And as I've kind of already mentioned, the, the prior budget closed with a surplus in it. We just won't know till December. And this budget that's already running and active is running under by quite a bit already um, as we get the reports coming in. So again, I, I really think that this, this body up here should take some sort of action tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilor Morgenstein. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I was caught a little off guard, this topic coming up. Um, and in retrospect, I want to thank my fellow councilors. I'm not sure your mic is on. This is, yeah, that's yeah, better, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I was caught quite off guard, the topic at all, and actually in retrospect now, I'm thankful to my fellow counselors and the public for bringing this up. Um, people keeping good track of figures since there's no Wi-Fi, I don't have a hotspot. Um, audience participation and my fellow counselors have brought up a lot of information that um, they were able to recall or um, use with their hotspot. Um, but I do specifically recall being told, if you don't approve the Simpson lot, then nothing will be done with the Wooding Kaplan lot. We were very specifically told by the mayor, if you want to get Wooding Kaplan done, you need to approve the whole project. So here we are now calling it one project or two projects one fiscal year, a calendar year, and another calendar year. The take home message is, we were threatened with not getting Wood and Kaplan done if we didn't do Simpson. And plenty of the public has been upset for many years at private landowners getting their lot done, and that's a whole big long story because of responsibilities we had for that lot becoming the condition that it did and we had our contract for that. But here we sit and it's not done and the public very much, I think Lucille was pretty restrained not to say, the, 
business owners of the Simpson lot were given a gift by the town, and now the town-owned lot sits undone again. And I think that needs to be heard. So, yeah, I, I will approve putting forward getting this project done. It's well past due. Thank you. Councilor Marone. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so being that, you know, I, I believed in the Simpson lot, I believe in the Wallace lot, I just wish that we did the thing that we said we were going to do in the beginning. And being as Councilor Laffin correctly stated, we can't force the administration to do anything. I have here a resolution that I'd like to read into the record and that uh, I would like to move the following resolution uh, w with regard to this. <clears throat> so be it resolved, whereas on January 12th, 2021, the mayor requested permission of the town council to rehabilitate and improve the parking areas on Wallace Avenue and in the rear of Simpson Court as one package, and whereas the town council desired to address the two projects separately due to at least the fact that the Wallace Avenue project involved town-owned property and the Simpson Court project involved property not owned by the town, and whereas the mayor adamantly opposed addressing the two projects separately, stating that either both get done or none get done, and whereas on said date the town council divided the question to vote on the two projects separately, ultimately approving of both projects, and whereas the Simpson Court project has been completed and the Wallace Avenue has been stalled until at least next year by the mayor, claiming project bid prices to be undesirable, and whereas the town council desires the Wallace Avenue project to be completed forthwith, and whereas the town council also desires that period lighting similar to that installed in Quinnipiac Street be installed at the Wallace Avenue site, and whereas there is no credible information before the town council that the improvement of the property comprising the Wallace Avenue project will be offset by any dramatically decrease in cost, and now therefore be it resolved that the Wallingford Town Council desires that the Wallace Avenue project be completed forthwith and awarding the project to the responsible bidder with the lowest bid price, such unanticipated funds to be appropriated from existing accounts. So moved. There's a resolution moved and seconded um, to the clerk. I su suspect you would benefit from a copy of that resolution for the record. Senator. Uh, so, Councillor Marone, will you see to it that the clerk gets a copy of that resolution? Certainly. Sure. Uh, I'm not going to be supporting the resolution because I believe that it has no binding effect on the administration. Um, with that, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Fishbein. Yes. Laffin. No. Marone. Yes. Morgenstein. Yes. Shortell. Yes. Tata. No. Testa. Yes. Zandri. Yes. Chairman Cervoni. No. The vote on the resolution is in favor of it. With that, back to our regularly scheduled program. On to item five on the agenda, the public question and answer period. Any takers in the back? Is that you, Mr. Morgenstein? Oh, no, please, Mr. Morgenstein. We've already heard from him. He, you, you can make him wait. Good evening, Larry Morgenstein, South Main Street. Through the chair to the mayor. Uh, obviously, we've been talking months about the shelter, the dog animal shelter. When we were left uh, in this drama a few weeks ago, we were on the verge of inspection from the state. Can you update us on the status of that? The uh, work was, was uh, bid for repair of fissures, cracks, uh, walls, and a fl I think floor. I don't know if the work has been completed. Uh, that work would be done under the supervision of uh, public works. So is there a cost that we know for the public? And again, has the state come back? Uh, are we going to be fined because we are subject to possible fining, not meeting the September 25th deadline of when they were coming back? I'm not aware of either, uh, either a reinspection or what the bid price might be. So are you going to update us or are we going to have to keep on coming back up to the microphone? It, will it be made public? because it has been of great interest to the public, and the only way we've gotten this information is through the public asking. And it would be nice if that could be like volunteered or put out in a press statement. 
uh, again, to have to try to pull this out week after week, month after month, it would be nice if you could be proactive, you know, let us know where things are at with air conditioning. Do we have any bids or anything solid on that front? I can let you know when I have information. Uh, again, would we have found out tonight if I hadn't asked? Not on the agenda. Certainly you could have called the office and asked at the office, but you choose to do it here. I would have no notice ahead of time that you chose to do it at a public meeting. But Again, either, either direction you, you choose, uh, the results would be the same. You'd get the information. Again, it's really important for our government to keep us informed. I guess it would be nicer if we didn't have to ask, call the office, if those things were made public. It's of public interest and it certainly would be in everybody's interest, including an efficient government to make people aware as things are updated and happen. Thank you. Mr. Gross. Bob Gross, Long Hill Road, through the chair to the mayor. Um, in a recent meeting, it was brought up that the treasurer's position has been unfulfilled for multiple years. You know about how many years? I don't. There was there were several efforts to appoint the treasurer. Uh, candidates were not found suitable. Uh, the deputy comptroller has been filling in for treasurer's positions uh, up until well, basically today when he was appointed comptroller. At this okay. point, we will be seeking to appoint a treasurer. Congratulations to Mr. Senna on the new position, are you going to replace Mr. Senna's position? I didn't understand your are question. You go, are you going to replace the assistant controller's position? Yes, we will. Because the reason I say this is because I don't remember the exact number of years, but it's been multiple years you've had no treasurer. So is the job need to be really filled? <laughs> Yes, we need a treasurer, uh, but we need someone who is uh, adequately trained and has the experience necessary to the, do the job. Uh, when we were not successful in obtaining one, then as an interim, the deputy has been filling in on that position. But again, we will have to hire not only a deputy, but we will have to hire a position that involves the treasurer responsibilities. As um, the are you planning on hiring the position for Scott Hanley's position? I don't know the exact term of it. Has that gone out to bid? I couldn't tell what S you said. S Scott Hanley, the person who took care of the meeting here. The director for government television? No, we have no intent at this point to replace that position. Because he's in the budget this year. I'm just saying there's there's 100,000 sitting in the budget that you, uh, that you taxed us on that you really have no no desire to fill. Community pool. Uh, Councillor Zandri brought it up. Again, I know you're going to say no right from the start. I don't, do you have any idea when you're going to have this consultant for your American Rescue Plan? We have a bid out. We're, we have a bid out. We're expecting to receive uh, proposals. Re, re, we expected to receive responses to the bid, and uh, I can't give you a time frame right now, but sooner, sooner the better. Well, yeah, because you've been saying it for a long time, I mean, for months now, and the only reason I say that is, again, the community pool got brought up, which was a shame it wasn't, hasn't been used or hasn't been able to been used because of the way it's been budgeted. But again, other communities around the state are, and this is something the town, for the council to think about, they're, used, they're taking some of this money and using it for town, for youth engagement through the police or through their public, you know, some of those departments. Uh, they're spending money on parks and playgrounds. They're taking money for COVID testing for people who can't afford the COVID testing to have the kits in their houses. They're spending this money on daycare. Now we have a daycare facility here to help people get your kids into daycare so people can get back to work. I know the mayor is going to respond no to all that, but how long are you going to wait? Because people are in need. There are 
there is a segment of the population that has a need for this dollars. That's why the government authorized it. How much longer do you plan on waiting before you make some of these decisions? As I stated before, we are waiting for a consultant to inform us how to set up accurately the record keeping that the Treasury Department requires. As I also have stated before, the prime purpose, is, as far as I'm concerned, for the ARPA funds is the help for individuals, for nonprofits, for businesses that have suffered under the, the uh, strains of the pandem pandemic. Uh, those, those, all of those applications will have to be received and reviewed and acted upon. Uh, we're going to do it in as logical and as, as accurate a way as possible. But that is the prime purpose. It is to restore economic health to, again, individuals, especially tourism industry, tourism industry as, as an industry itself and nonprofits to restore them to a position where they're able to function well. So you're going to look to restore the tourism industry for Wallingford? <laughs> just what you just said. I, well, that, that's not exactly what I said. We're not going to restore the tourism industry. We will look to support them in the sense that where money was lost due to the pandemic and it was not covered by other programs or other grants, then they will be part of the application process and hopefully be entitled to receive funds. Mr. Gross, you're over time. Okay. Can I just see if there's anybody else okay. who has anything for public question answer? Uh, Mr. Rice? My name is <clears throat> Raymond Rice, 96 Pearson Drive in Wallingford. I just wanted to, it, it's not a question, it's not an answer, just a plain comment. When I wanted to know something about uh, Veterans Memorial Park, I called the mayor's office. I didn't come before the council or this question and answer period and ask them. I just went directly and I got an answer. When I wanted to talk about something that dealt with the council, I didn't come here and ask the council, unless it's extremely important that everybody knows. This is the way I operated when I was a town councilor. I didn't question department heads constantly. I tried to get answers prior to the meeting. That way I knew what was going on. And I, be I believe the public knows what's going on. I just feel that the council, the mayor, this town is running pretty smooth. I'm very happy with the way it's going. Keep up the good work. Ms. Casagrande. Casagrande, Southview Drive. I just want to have you repeat something, Mr. Chairman, if you would. You voted against going ahead with this project. That's not what I voted against. Okay. I, I voted against the resolution because I don't believe it has the legal impact to force the administration to do anything. So you think that even though the majority of the council voted to go ahead with this, that it does not have the legal ramifications or the legal, I don't know what you want to call it. It was by definition a resolution. So, so possibly nothing can be done. The administration doesn't have to do the will of the council. The council made a statement. I, when, these, when these projects were on our agenda on January 12th, I voted in favor of both of them. Okay. I'm, I'm just, not against the project. I just want to clarify what you said. I didn't understand it. The administration, even though the majority of the council voted to go ahead, the an administration is under no onus to proceed with that. Pursuant to the charter, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to let Mr. Gross and Mr. Morgenstein fight it out. Morganstein, South Main. This is a question to you, Chairman Cervoni. Just a point of order. Uh, we're going to have the presentation tonight. It's not a votable action. Will the public get input? That's all I wanted to ask. Which presentation? Uh, the poll uh, for the YMCA. The public, pursuant to the council rules, the public will be given the opportunity to comment. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. 
Mr. Gross. Just to wrap up then, just through the chair to the mayor, just if you're looking to do, well, the community pool, I don't remember what I said, but that is an actionable thing through the, the uh, America Rescue Plan. It is a viable use of some of that money. Um, through the mayor, I, I assume we still don't have a grant writer in town. We have a grant writer, Susan Schott. Okay, so between the grant writer and the controller, the forms, because there's small communities that are working these out, couldn't start with some of these dollars going out. We don't have the, power, the ability. We're a pretty large town, almost 50,000 people. We have to rely on somebody else to help us through these forms. The United States Treasury Department's instructions are very detailed and complex with regard to the record keeping, even, even to the extent of requiring, I believe, a municipality to monitor how an entity that receives funds uses those funds. I, I think we need to make an effort to comply with all of what the U.S. Treasury Department requires. And that's why the way you're proposing it it's going to make it very difficult and onerous on whoever's doing it because you're looking to help small pockets, so it might be 10,000 here, 20,000 here, to keep tabs on everybody where you have the ability to do large-scale projects, whether a portion of community pool, some park projects, some infrastructure projects, some taking care of town hall here, making it more uh, uh, internet-friendly, user-friendly, uh, if there's another pandemic, safer for the departments that work in this building. You have the ability to do all that in small groups of people to monitor the money. The way you're talking about it, you're going to have hundreds of people, and you're going to have to monitor hundreds of people on how they spend the money. That's a very onerous way to do it. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I can just respond to that. I think, I think for the well-being of the people and businesses in the town, that's exactly what we should do. They're the ones who should receive the first for support from the effects of the pandemic. Government is always ready to spend money on government projects. The people out there who have suffered, lost money, lost jobs, these are the ones we need to respond to first. Nobody's saying not to help out people. One of the things could have been the parking lot, which would help out the restaurants downtown, and you can build it up. Um, I'm, there's, you're, not, you're not helping right now people who have problems paying their mortgage, you can help them right now do that, but yet you're deciding to wait till you have this person come in here. By then, these people might be evicted from their premises, their credit rating might be destroyed for years, and that will, of course, trickle down, can't buy a car, can't get a loan, etc. This is the time that you need to start helping people, the small people. Thank you. Ms. McKean. Good evening, Eileen McKean, Burke Heights Drive. So to, uh, to support what Mr. Gross says, government really is here to serve its citizens and to those funds are intended to support the economy. So yeah, you can help people, but you can help people by, in, you know, by helping businesses rebound and rehire the people that they let go at the beginning of the pandemic. So we also, I think, would do wise to plan for our future a little better, rather than build a parking lot for today, build a parking lot for tomorrow, and include not only lighting, but bike racks and a few electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, on the, um, since I'm up here, the um, recreational use at Tyler Mill, as Councillor Fishbein indicated, perhaps hunting is part of that. DEP has said for decades that the carrying point, the deer are overpopulated, at least double the carrying point of that environment, and perhaps you could consider opening it to bow hunting. Uh, right now we have firearms hunting of small game on two or three days a week. Um, bow hunting is very safe. Archery is actually considered by the National Council of Safety to be safer than all ball sports, including golf. You are less likely to be hurt shooting archery or participating in archery, then you are participating in golf. Thank you. Thank you. 
And uh, there appearing to be no more takers for the public question and answer period, I close that. Move on to item six on the agenda, which is discussion uh, with youth and social services regarding diversionary programs available for youth as well as programming to minimize the need for intervention. Uh, Ms. Miranda, thank you for joining us. If you could just let the crowd know who you are. I'm just going to okay. <laughs> um, I'm Mandy Miranda. I am the director at Youth and Social Services. Thank you. Um, uh, several meetings ago, we had uh, the police department here talking about uh, what was going on in Doolittle Park um, and other issues involving youth in our community. Um, and I thought that I, as well as Councilors Laffin and Shortell, thought that uh, the public would benefit from uh, some information from you about what it is that Youth and Social Services is doing and, and, and does uh, to address assisting our youth at this point in time. So prior to coming to Youth and Social Services, I was at the police department for 18 years where I oversaw the juvenile diversion program um, as the community uh, youth officer, civilian. In that role, I worked with the officers in different juvenile cases that would come up. It could be something where it was a minor um, offense, criminal charge, and then they would, um, the youth would be referred over. Um, it would be a minor misdemeanor offense. It could be the first time, um, second offense. Uh, but it would come to, my, to the office. Uh, when I came over to Youth and Social Services, actually it's a year this week, so I've been there a year, um, that program followed me. I, so I, I took that on, uh, and where I continue to work with the police department, um, where I get referrals from the officers. There's a chain um, within the department. Actually, the, the um, now chief, police chief uh, forwards the reports over to me, um, where I then do an intake process. You know, I review the reports, um, and then determine based on the circumstances, it's situational, um, of what transpires from there. As diversion, it real, diversion really is the, the goal is not to have youth going to court if it's appropriate to do so. Um, it's those, like I said, those first time offenses. Um, they may be younger, younger in age. Uh, you know, choices get made and those choices, you don't want them to kind of hang over their heads for, you know, forever or for an extended period of time. They made a choice. Um, you, you know, you hopefully the goal is to learn from it and we move on, right? So with that, we, um, I take those cases. We've had approximately in the year that I've been at Youth and Social Services, I've had 78 cases referred to me from the police department. Not all of those cases are cases where there could be a criminal charge associated. Some of the times I will get officers referring cases because there are status events. So things like um, running away from, you know, not coming home by curfew, out of control behavior at home, um, not getting along with parents. Um, people will call officers to come out. Those officers then refer those, those families over to me and, and you, or to Youth and Social Services. And again, I'm, there's a variety of things that I can do with that. Uh, the response I usually get from families when I receive those reports and call has always been, I mean, the, for the eight, nine, 18, 19 years now of doing this, has always been very positive. I've never really had an issue of anyone saying, no, I don't want to be involved. It's always been, okay, what are my options? What can we, what can we do? Um, here's the circumstances. I hear about more of what's going on because um, there's always, there tends to be more. There may be other concerns families have um, besides that one incident. And we talk about that. We talk about different uh, options that are out there within the community, within the office that we can um, 
work with the family on. Uh, in those, seven, those 78 cases, I, this year, two of the cases I did send back to the police department. Um, one was more appropriate actually for that, um, that youth to actually receive a summons and go to court um, than to actually come through our, our diversionary program. The other thing, the other case was it was a younger child. Um, and I know in talking with the family, services were already in place and it was appropriate. And it would have been a duplication of our services. So it didn't make sense for us to con continue at that point, even though the family is aware of what we do. So it's to follow up. Um, in addition, we get school referrals. So it's not just from the police department. Uh, a lot of the cases we get from the, the schools really are more truancy based. School refusals, uh, last year logging in, you know, on their computers, that was, I mean, a year and a half, you know, through COVID, that was a concern. Um, I may have the peer to peer issues that I might get through the school systems. Um, and sometimes I'll get referrals because there's issues that maybe there's concerns at home or outside in the community that the school personnel become aware of and as a community resource they'll reach out to us in order to reach out to the families. Uh, last year, so from October 2020 through June of 2021, I had 108 referrals from the schools. Um, that also included um, the alternative to suspension program, uh, which we have in town where if youth are vaping, if there's you know marijuana, um, alcohol, which I haven't really seen this year. Um, but if there's those types of situations in lieu of getting a 10 day suspension, they follow through with our program, um, they can get five days of, of an out of school suspension. And that program consists of, of meeting approximately five times um, where you have an intake session. We do education on legal consequences as well as education on whatever brought you in. So, you know, if, if it's marijuana, the effects of marijuana, what does, does that have on your, on your body? Um, social implications, all of those things. We talk about that. Families are involved in the education. Uh, we also reach out to community resources in town. We use Coalition quite a bit, Coalition for Better Wallingford, as an opportunity for youth to become involved. So whatever's going on at that moment in time for, for their programming, I may have a youth involved in that. That might be one of their requirements. Uh, in addition to, so that was an, um, 108 referrals last year. So to date, I have 20 cases. Um, so mid-October, school started beginning of September, and I have 20 cases that have, 20 referrals that have come in. Again, kids having a hard time going to school. Um, some alternative to, to suspension type of programming. Um, it was, those seem to be the, um, the most common. In the way of intervention, we occur, of intervention occurs pretty quickly. So when an officer refers, we're getting that information on a relatively quick pace. There's not this huge time lapse, which is really important for youth. Um, so I, again, because I have the relationship that, that I have with the police department, we're getting notified, I'm getting notified at a, at a pretty quick pace um, through the, the chief and have, can have the conversations with the officer on the cases um, that I receive. We're not waiting these, these weeks on end because then the, the effects aren't as strong, you know, in meeting with the families. Intervention could look like, could look a lot, a lot of different things. Always starts with a phone call with the families. Um, we go into meetings with, with the youth and family together. I've done individual meetings. Uh, frequently, frequent follow-ups, um, various assessment tools I've used as well where I have them filling out assessments so I have a better idea as to what's happening. Um, Education is provided on the potential legal consequences, always. That's one of my common things I always do um, if they're coming in, especially on a police referral. Um, as well as talk about other possible consequences. We do educational curriculum for parents and youth, again, based on the circumstances. If it's a social media, um, issue that brought a youth in, which a lot of times, I mean, that's another common 
One, especially with, with the amount of use that we're using, you know, this day and age. Uh, education on how to use it properly and safely um, is always talked about with parents as well as, as youth. Assignments um, may be given. I've done that throughout my years. Um, it could be as simple as maybe an apology letter to an officer or to your parents um, or to a research project I may have them do. But that's something, again, thinking about all, all the information that they're receiving and having them now come up with a, a, a product right, to present. Uh, referrals may be made for further counseling within youth and social services or local agencies um, where I'm referring them out. Um, we have the capability of, we have counselors that we have worked with in the past, um, and currently we can assist with co-pays when needed, um, if, that's a, if that's a struggle for families. Um, we have a counselor that works on staff part-time that we've utilized too. Um, and then, I mean, community service. I'm a big believer in giving back and having the youth being involved. If they, if they become involved in something that connects for them, and we find that niche, then you know, good things are gonna happen. So that's me having those conversations with the youth and the family and trying to, and working with them in that way, and then reaching out um, to Wallingford. We've got really great resources in town that, that we can tap into. Um, different nonprofit agencies, um, programs within the schools, you, you name it, we've got, I've been able to utilize pretty much everybody at some point in time. Um, so that's been a really good, positive thing. Um, currently I'm looking, um, we do have a part-time position for an intervention coordinator that we're looking to, to fill. That is for this diversion piece. Um, looking for someone that I have found with this especially recently that a lot of the, the families that I'm seeing already have counselors in place. But they've been, they've been working with people. Um, so working with a family that doesn't, that already has counseling, but we still need to do the diversion and still need to, to follow up and provide that education. Um, so having that person fit that role and to help in that, that type of programming. In addition to that, I mean, the intervention piece, I mean, it's prevention. I mean, the whole goal is not to get the kids, youth, right, involved in any sort of negative um, programming or, you know, just making the poor choices. You want to catch them before that happens. So looking at, like I had said, we have the counseling already in place. Um, we can have a families reach out just because they're seeing stuff at home or in, in their communities and they're just looking for, for counseling resources. And we can help them with that. Other youth programming we have, I mean, runs the gamut. We've got peer advocate programming. Um, the goal with, our, with that peer advocate program is the high school um, students provide peer-to-peer -peer support, but they also provide support for the younger, for the youth, the younger youth in the community as well. Um, and actually, we're starting that tomorrow the, for the first meeting of the school year. So that's beginning tomorrow. But we have the summer youth employment program. Um, which I have actually utilized with some of the youth that I've worked with through these referrals, getting them involved, getting them, edu you know, how to work, a, how to interview, job interview, um, and connecting them in those types of programs um, in the summer and earning a paycheck and just, you know, increasing that self-esteem and finding, again, finding those connections. And then we can go on and on. We have the youth awards. We have, I mean, we have youth the job banks. We've done bike rodeos this summer, at all the summer camps. You know, so and again, getting the education out there, riding your bike safely, but pulling in some of those older teens um, with some of the bike issues that can come up, pulling some of them in to help with these, this type of programming. Again, giving back. Uh, like I said, I can go on and on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. And, and I appreciate that I, you started off with the, you know, the, the intervention and diversionary programs, which are really reactive. Yeah. You know, that, that's, you've, you've got somebody who's been identified, whether it's by, you know, the police interaction or school interaction, right. um, into what you do that's somewhat proactive. Um, and it's, it's good to know that you're doing some proactive programs. I, I wish that we could get um, the kids who are, riding bicycles at the intersection of North and South Main Street, yeah. crossing Center Street, 
you know, during rush hour traffic, I wish we could get them to go to your bike rodeos. Um, do, you, do you feel that in your reactive programs um, that you have some level of success that the, the, the intervention is successful? I, oh, excuse me, I do. I do feel like, you know, in that moment it does. And like anything, it goes, it ebbs and flows. You know, things all, with a lot of the youth, yes, and they get it, they understand that, they, you know, the, the families are totally on board. Um, but now what happens is that door's already been opened. So now an, an, so another issue comes up down the road later on. Those, I'll get those phone calls from families, you know, and they'll say, you know, oh, this is just, this is what happens. You know, this is a new situation. What do I do? Or what are my options? You know, can you, can you meet with my child? So just having that, that initial interaction now gives that family that resource moving forward where they have, they have someone that they can call and, and talk to and you know, create, there's, that relationship has been built. The, ground, the groundwork has already been built. Um, you know, and being in town and being local and accessible you know, for people has been now I see it. I mean, I see people come back. And that's what happened when I was working in the police department as well. It was the same type of, you know, families would call you, you know. Sure. It went that, again, the ebb and flow of, of, of life, really. So. Thank you. Um, questions from the council? Councilor Fishman. Thank you, Mandy, for coming. And I, I, um, I appreciate you reached out to me after that meeting that we mm -hmm. had with the the police department, um, you know, it seems to me that you're perhaps more efficient than our court process. And I, and I just say that because, you know, presently when a youth gets arrested, mm -hmm. um, arraignment is supposed to happen no less than 14 days later. Mm -hmm. It appears to me, and, and usually arraignment, you're getting involved with diversionary programs and that kind of stuff, and you want to get kids into this stuff quicker, right? So when you're like right on top of it, you know, I'd rather see that kid get into that diversionary program because a lot can happen in 14 days. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Um, one of the things you mentioned was about the runaways. And, you know, I'm pretty much, you know, doing a lot with juvenile justice up in Hartford and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I had a, a mom call me from a more urban area last week. And she's concerned because her son keeps on running away, leaving, you know, out the window in the middle of the night doing bad stuff and what do you do? What do you, what do you do? What would you do in your role if you got that call, the runaway or the doesn't sneaking out and the, yeah. Um, that is not, that is not an easy one for sure. I would probably, well, starting off with talking to mom, right? What, you know, kind of what's going on, getting the, the kind of the lay of the land, you know, the circumstances, um, offering to meet with the, the youth, um, and then talking with the youth and figuring out, okay, you know, so, you know, why are you going out? What's, what's happening? Like, what, what's happening here in this situation? And it could and be ju they just have nothing else to do, right? So if you get them involved with some sort of mm -hmm. community project where they have a sense of accomplishment, which is really mm -hmm. important to people, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that would help. You know, she, she, she was so frustrated. She wanted to put a, have a GPS bracelet, you know, so that she knew when, you know, in the middle of the night the kid left. And, you know, I, I couldn't give her a lot of guidance. So, um, you know, I appreciate your answer and appreciate everything you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else on the council? Questions or comments from the public? Thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, yeah. Please keep it up. Obviously, it's important. And I did want to share one, just one more please thing. Please do. I wanted. Um, the end of October, the police chief, myself, and uh, Kenny Michaels are going to sit down with the, the community around Doolittle Park to touch base on kind of you know how things are going and what's happening there. I know the chief had mentioned that in the last um, meeting, so I talked with him today about that. So that's the plan um, for the end of October. So, and thank yeah. you for that update. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, on to item seven, which is a.
presentation regarding the YMCA pool project and potential Wallingford partnership. Um, Councillor Shortell is our liaison to the Rec Department Pool Committee. You've requested this item and uh, I'll offer you the opportunity to start talking about it if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will always start talking if you offer me the opportunity. Um, your mic's dead. My mic's dead. No, no it's not. Uh, I just I want to give for the members of the public who are watching or who are here, I want to give some context to why I put this on the agenda. So just some history. Uh, this is my fault. This is my fault. So, so a lot of times things pop on agendas and it's a conspiracy from Mayor Dickinson and we're going to do this. This is Sean and the YMCA approached the town toward the end of the summer. And uh, I'm a member of the Y, full disclosure. I'm also a, my kids both swim on the Dolphins swim team. Um, I'm, a, I'm a swim official, level one. Um, I want to be level two later this year, we'll see. But, um, so Sean, I know, I will keep it up. Uh, I want to get on the mic. Level two gets to go on the mic, so that's my goal. So Sean approached me, I'm there, I'm at the Y every day trying to get the COVID weight off, and he mentioned it to me, and I invited myself to the meeting. So that's what happened. The meeting was with Mayor Dickinson. Uh, I let Chairman Cervoni and Vice Chair Laffin know as well. Chairman Cervoni went. Uh, Sean and Courtney Grimm were there and Mr. Sargent, they were there and Kenny was there. And that meeting was August 8th. And it was, that's ostensibly the presentation you're gonna see tonight was presented at that meeting. And um, nothing was, it was just a meeting. And after that meeting, we kind of all said, well, let's get this out in public. Let's let the public hear about this and let's just start talking about it. So uh, the first directive was to go to the pool committee and at some point, it ended up on the Parks and Rec agenda instead on September 8th, I think. It ended up, that's where it went public, uh, at one of your 8 a.m. meetings. Uh, the 8 a.m. meetings kill me, but uh, I wasn't there, but you, you guys presented there. So that's where it went public. And we were trying to get, it may yet go to the pool. The pool committee is very similar to the Park and Rec Commission. I mean, it's, it's a lot of overlap. I don't know exactly how much overlap it is. It's, it's I don't know, there's overlap there. So I had this on the agenda for the 28th of September and then it got, we, we decided to bump it because there was a lot on that agenda. Um, there's a lot on every agenda as you hear tonight. So it, it, anyway, that's how we got here. I just wanted everyone to know that. Um, no one has fought harder for the pool than I have and I'm not giving up on community pool. I'm st I still want community pool. Um, one of my jobs as a counselor is to explore every option. And I'm gonna do that till the day I'm off, which is, 92 days away or whatever it is, 12 hours, six minutes. But I'm going to fight for any option. Doesn't mean I'm giving up, but, but what it does mean is, you know, we want, and I don't want to speak for the other eight counselors, but I, one of the things that frustrates me as a counselor is when we're given, you do this or you do nothing. And we hear it all the time up here. You can't do this, you got to do that, whatever the situation is. And uh, the ARPA funds, we just talked about that tonight. Councillor Testa put the ARPA funds on the agenda twice in the last uh, two months or so. And the spirit of Councillor Testa doing that was let's, let's look at it. We could give it to individuals and nonprofits and businesses who have suffered, but we also could do other things with it that other towns are doing. Let's look at it. This is no different. I'm doing this in the same spirit. I'm just saying, let's look at this. This is a presentation. There's no vote tonight. There's no decision tonight. Um, and it may turn out, you know, Sean and Courtney and Mr. Sarge, they're going to present something. We're going to have a, a lot of questions. You all have a lot of questions. Many of you may be, you may think this is dead on arrival. I don't think it's dead on arrival. I think we really have to look at it. I'm intrigued by this possibility, I'll be honest. But I just think it, it's worthy of going through the public process and then working with the administration, working with Kenny, and seeing if we can come up with something. And if we can't, we can't, but at least we tried. So that's why, that's my intention here. I just wanted to put that out there so everyone knew how it got on the agenda, why it's here, and, and why, why I wanted to um, put it on, put it on the agenda. So um, hopefully I make things worse for you guys by doing, saying all that, but um, don't get mad at the mayor, get mad at me for the reason it's up here, and we'll go from there. So I'll, I, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. If you would please introduce yourselves for the record. Thank you. Let's start to my right. Hi, I'm Courtney Grimm. I am the Wallingford YMCA board chair. 
My name is Samuel Sargent. I am on the Wallingford Y board. And uh, Sean Doherty, I'm the executive director for the Wallingford Family YMCA. Thank you. What do you have for us? Okay. Um, now, since the time I may f go through some of these slides um, quickly, um, by any at any time, please uh, stop me, ask me questions, all that kind of, kind of good stuff. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Why the why? Just to set a little backdrop for you, for everybody. Um, as everybody knows, we talked about COVID tonight. Um, the YMCA um, was also shut down for about 95 days. Um, no income whatsoever. Uh, we worked uh, very closely with our board of directors to make sure we uh, put everything we we had we could on from a from an expansion time time of things uh, to put a, that on pause and work on financial sustainability, and that's what we focused on. Um, we redid our impact, really focusing on what our impact is for the community as a nonprofit and what our focus is, such as youth development, healthy life, living, and social responsibility. We took a look at our um, pillars of focus, serving families, supporting seniors, redefining our membership so we are, make sure we are open for all at all times, as well as fostering partnerships, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we're here tonight. Give you a little back, uh, background as far as our history working together. Um, 1945, we were at the town hall, uh, the second floor. Uh, this was off on Center Street. Uh, then we moved into South Elm Street uh, in 1953. Um, we, in 1990, we partnered with the, with the Board of Ed in regards to before and after school programs, and 31 years later, those are going strong, uh, thanks to the great staff that we have working for the Y. 2008, we worked with the Park and Rec in regards to combining our road races uh, to rename it as the Fish by YMCA Community Road Race. Uh, 2009, we worked with the Parks and Rec again, the Youth and Social Services, um, to lead Activate Wallingford, which was an uh, initiative to help fight childhood obesity through a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. 2013, we worked again with the Parks and Rec, the Board of Ed, the YMCA, and of of course, the Rotary Club to build a low ropes course over at Bertini Park um, for campers, schools, youth programs, and opportunities thanks to um, John Golak at the time and the Park and Rec uh, Department. Um, more collaborations um, that currently exist today. Um, the YMCA facilities, as, as you guys know, are, we have two main facilities in town, one on the east side, one on the west side. Um, we provide warming centers, cooling centers during extreme water, weather con conditions. So um, if it's too cold and you need to come in out of the cold, um, there is no charge for you at the Y. Um, if it's too warm, you want to get in out of, out of the heat, come into the Y, there is no charge. We're not going to ask any questions. We coordinate this with the health department and the mayor's office. We're also a backup shelter listed um, for the Red Cross. Um, we, are, we coordinate blood drives. COVID now, vaccine drives and clinics, uh, as well as flu drives, uh, food drives for Massasmana, um, school supply drives for the Wallingford Public School System and Wallingford families, as well as each year we um, uh, do a, a toy drive for the holiday giving through our Scuba, for Santa, scuba Santa program. Um, just to give you an idea as far as background on um, our aquatics programming, uh, swim lessons, uh, this year will serve over 1,300 kids. Um, including um, by year end about 100 kids from the Ober Boys and Girls Club and Spanish Community Wallingford uh, through a Learn to Swim grant. So there was free swim lessons um, that we taught the kids uh, from both of those organizations. Uh, we're also teaching our first deaf student how to swim with the assistance of a sign language interpreter. Uh, and this is pretty neat stuff, thanks to our uh, great aquatics department who's in the stands tonight. Um, we also have a swim team that's been going strong for, I, I would say, about 50 years. Um, this year, we pre-COVID, we're about 120 in the fall, winter season. Uh, we had to dip down due to restrictions and whatnot, uh, and now we're back up to, and my, I'm hearing that it's over 70 currently, and more registrations coming on board, so it's great to see those kids back in the water. 
We also do a lot of water wellness classes, seven classes per week just for water aerobics, 25 to 30 participants per class, Aquafit, Silver Splash. We've done a Parkinson's water exercise class that unfortunately uh, was, hasn't re, re, reconvened since uh, COVID, but we're planning on getting that back on the ground in uh, January of 22. And then new classes such as Aqua Zumba, Aqua Yoga, et cetera. Um, we also, uh, due to constraints at our 81 South Elm Street location, we've, we rent uh, space at Sheehan Pool as well as Farms Country Club uh, for our swim team. We work with the uh, Board of Ed in regards to Sheehan Pool, um, helping staff their, uh, their pools. Right now we're working with the health department, I mean the um, PE leader there because uh, we're, we have a shortage for lifeguards currently. But, um, that's soon rectified. And as, as well as Chilt Rosemary Hall has also asked us for uh, support in helping manage their lifeguards and swim lessons there. Um, just to put a backdrop as well in regards to our project, uh, we did a community needs assessment back in about two, 2018 to, into 2019. I'm really going to just focus on two of those big items, which is 60% of adults in Connecticut are overbeast uh, or overweight as well as drowning is the second leading cause of death in children under 14 years old. Uh, so our, our biggest initiative is getting that, uh, those, kids learning the, uh, those kids learning how to swim, um, especially we're focusing on a Hispanic um, demographic as well, uh, knowing that um, drownings in Hispanic is also um, very high as well. In order to do that, some of our solutions are um, this uh, expansion of aquatic uh, opportunities for the community. Community benefit, uh, the impact. Why do we do things? Why, uh, why does anybody do anything? There's got to be some method behind everybody's madness. We are, we are really focusing on healthy lifestyles, ch childhood obesity, family time together. I won't go through the entire list, but basically expanding our uh, aquatic opportunities, stimulating good job growth, and the overall quality of life for the greater Wallingford community. We also reached out to residents in regards to what are you looking for from a um, amenity standpoint to expand um, facilities uh, within the YMCA. If you notice the top four uh, are all water related. Um, I, went, I stretched it with the steam, but um, the water, water, uh, warm water exercise and therapy pool 61%, whirlpool 49%, indoor multi-purpose uh, lap pool 46%. Um, and then followed by a family pool uh, with water park features, et cetera. Indoor track, which we're looking to put in at Westside as well. Programs, lap swim, getting youth uh, away from the couch and away from the screen as best as possible, especially COVID did not improve that at all. Um, focusing on youth violence and prevention. Um, Mandy was talking about that earlier. Um, we're talking about doing a Yega, uh, uh, youth Lego or rob uh, robotics, uh, youth fitness, et cetera, and also music. It brings us to, okay, that's, that was the backdrop. Um, we did our research. We uh, were um, expanding at the seams at Eastside. Uh, we had to expand uh, the uh, amenities and the, um, the square footage for the Y uh, based on demand from the membership. Um, so we came, we developed this uh, Healthy Communities campaign that was approved by the Board of Directors in the latter part of 2018. Um, no, phase one was to secure the permanent location, which we did in the fall of uh, 2019. Um, that, uh, the west side uh, naturally needs a roof. The high roof is going to be in place, um, and now it's going to be December. It keeps pushing it off because of materials and delays, et cetera. Um, east side renovations, uh, we built a new playscape thanks, thanks to the Ulbrich family. And then we've also upgraded our lap pool and therapy pool lighting um, this past year as well. Now shift gears and what we're going to be focused on tonight is talking about the west side aquatics edition. Uh, for years at that location, uh, the members have been asking for an aquatic venue. Um, it's hard to get into the four lane pool over at the east side location where there are all the programs that are going on there. Um, and the members are, uh, do not have that availability. So right now we're focusing our Just Add Water campaign on phase two of the campaign. And this is kind of our uh, vision. Um, this includes an eight lane pool, um, a warm water area in regards to, that will also provide water aerobics, um, play structures, um, 
a slide, et cetera. Um, the, new, the addition will also include locker rooms, family, and special needs, as well as the focus is gonna be as a glass enclosure with a retractable roof and opening side door panels. Programming, uh, which is still in development at this point, um, is swim lessons for all ages, swim team, adult sw lap swim, water polo, um, scuba, di scuba diving classes, which we used to hold, hold at the Y in Wallingford, but there's space restrictions, uh, synchronized swimming, uh, water volleyball, aqua zumba, yoga, et cetera. And then in the warm water pool, that'll be used for therapy classes, hospital collaboration programming, which we're talking to two folks, um, family swim, water aerobics, and swim lessons for infant toddlers. Um, now to the site over at West Side. This is 8 North Turnpike Road. Um, the area right here, uh, I don't know, you can't see the clicker. <laughs> um, in the center is actually the existing facility, the bulk of it. Um, and if um, maybe I'll turn the mic over to Sam Sargent, our architect, uh, to maybe point it out on the, the uh, map to the left as well for you guys. Gentlemen, uh, commissioners, uh, uh, is it better on the screen or would you like me to go over to the, uh, to the easel? Uh, if you could direct to the screen, I think more members of the public would benefit than if you go to the easel. I'm saying there. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Um, if, if you look at the image on the screen, the, the center portion of the building uh, is the existing uh, facility, the west side facility. Um, the colored portions of the building are changes that we want to make in the immediate future, and they include the eight-lane pool, the, uh, the larger of the two pools, and in this scheme, the rectangular pool is the warm water pool. Um, the image that uh, Sean showed you is our dream. And we're working with a uh, company out of Massachusetts to design something that's not as boring and rectilinear as what you see there for the warm water pool. So it'll have a splash area and all kinds of water features around it. And that, again, is the smaller of the two pools. Uh, adjacent to the pools are the locker rooms, which are the tan space, and the mechanical rooms, which are in gray to the right. Uh, we're also hoping uh, to add to the back of the building. There was a previously approved addition for the back of the building, and we are hoping to expand that previously approved addition. The really wonderful feature of this uh, aquatic center is, however, not in the plan, it's in the roof structure, the enclosure. And if anybody here has been to Milford to see the enclosure at the uh, uh, Milford Y, I have to tell you, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, when I first saw these drawings from open air, I was skeptical. But to actually go and see it in person is, it's absolutely remarkable. And they actually say that when you're in that enclosure and it happens to be snowing outside, it is actually uh, a, a wonderful place to be because it's completely heated and uh, uh, tempered and you get to have all those indoor pool activities while it's, uh, there's uh, four feet of snow on the ground outside. I really encourage everybody who has a chance to, uh, to go to the Milford uh, Y and see their, th uh, their pool enclosure. And this pool enclosure features a retractable roof and large sliding doors to provide um, uh, summer uh, circulation uh, of air and uh, reduce the, what would you say, the stuffiness that is normally associated with a pool enclosure environment. It's almost like having a pool in the, out, in the outdoors uh, when the weather is right. And then if the weather turns, at the press of a button, I think as Sean would say, the, the roof panels close and um, you are swimming in comfort. Um, 365 days of the year. And uh, that, I think, is a pretty good description. Are there any questions? None yet. Well said. Thanks, Sam. Um, 
the, uh, the estimated project timeline for this is uh, we're currently in our fundraising uh, time frame. Uh, we are hoping to get to the 50% mark by December 31st, 2021. Uh, it is aggressive. We're at about 28% right now, uh, thanks to the support from the state of Connecticut um, and some other major gifts. Um, we're then hoping to launch a public campaign in January. Of course, this is public TV, so I guess I've already done that. But um, anyways, uh, formally announce it in uh, January. Um, and that's where we focus on um, bringing the community involved in the project and hopefully getting to the 100% mark by uh, the end of April, if possible. Um, estimated project timeline from the construction time frame. So while we're fundraising, uh, we have one committee for that, uh, and we have also have another uh, planning committee, which um, Sam is a major part of dr and driver on that. Uh, what we're doing now is making sure that the, uh, we're working with the, our folks from Inland Wetlands. Um, they actually gave us direction to put it the addition on the front of the building versus the rear of the building uh, as it encroached the wetlands area. Um, we're also now working on a project budget. Um, uh, we'll also then bring it back to Inland Wetlands uh, once the drawings are all set. Sam's working hard on those. Um, and as we're kind of designing the interior of the building and the flow, um, though, so all the, all the architectural drawings, the renderings, et cetera, should be done by the end of the year. Um, based on our fundra fundraising uh, progress and the green light uh, from the board of directors, uh, we're looking to go out to bid in the February, uh, March timeframe. Uh, permitting shortly thereafter, and uh, construction is estimated at about 12 months for this project. Now the screen you've been all waiting for. Now, the proposed collaboration plan, and again, this is again proposed. This is, uh, uh, these are conceptual ideas um, and what our overall arching uh, goal out of the, all this is uh, to create, uh, expand on our current partnerships and create a, an, an aquatics uh, partnership within the community. Um, Town of Wallingford investment of $2 million plus, we want to steal your uh, park and rec director and commission for involvement in planning and programming efforts. Um, what the Y is going to do, um, we're, we're going to continue investing in uh, over three to four million. Uh, the project costs, we're estimating from five to six million. Again, getting to your, your points earlier, uh, prices are increasing. Um, so we're anticipating five to six million for this right now. I have a, I have a price pre-COVID of 4.9. Naming opportunity for Aquatic Center. Um, the game plan is to offer all town residents pool passes those being daily, monthly, and annual in perpetuity, um, provide 20,000 hours of year-round uh, resident access for 50 years. 50 years was the figure that um, you, you estimate as far as the life of the, of the asset, let's say. The 20 hours was basically, at any given time, the YMCA is open from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., um, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays. The game plan is to have uh, where town residents would have access to all three pools because we re plan on retaining the four lane pool at our east side location. Um, so while the Y is open, the residents would have access to either of the pools. Now, yes, we will have activities going on, but we will be working on the scheduling to make sure that town residents have access to open swim at e either of those three pools. Um, we're going to operate, we're going to staff it, we're going to maintain it. Uh, for the life of the asset, of course, and then beyond. Uh, we're involving um, the Park and Rec Director and Commission in planning and programming efforts. Uh, our hopes are to develop the parcel of land on the property, um, which is on River Road. Um, right now, if you look at the site, it's not that attractive. Um, our game plan is to um, develop as much as we can the area uh, on River Road to, for ball fields, for park space, et cetera, to uh, as best, best as we can develop it. There is some wetlands get, that goes throughout. And then, of course, um, we, will re, we will assume liability from a, res, when it, from a ownership standpoint. Um, if there's joint programming and everything, that has to be detailed out, of course. Um, but that is um, 
the pro, uh, collaboration and um, the next screen, and uh, my apologies if it sent <laughs> folks uh, scurrying, these are collaboration items, ideas to discuss, and maybe it was the wording, but um, one of the things was, uh, will the YMCA residents be required to join the Y to access the aquatic center and amenities? That's of course a discussion item, uh, but it is not our intent uh, for, the, for the residents to have to join the Y and then have to pur purchase a pool pass. No, we wanna make this as easy as it is to, to utilize community pool, that you can also utilize the YMCA Aquatic Center. Um, will there be restricted timeframes where residents will not be able to use it? As I um, mentioned just earlier, yes, there will be swim teams from uh, meets from time to time, but as Courtney knows better than I, there's maybe six to eight of those home meets per year and whatnot. Um, programming collaborations with the Park and Rec and the YMCA, those are to be determined. Uh, the sky's the limit. If a Wallingford resident cannot afford a daily, monthly, or annual pass, this is a guaranteed. Uh, we don't have to discuss this item. The YMCA never turns anybody away with the inability to pay. We, we knock on doors on an annual basis. We do fundraisers on an annual basis to provide programs and services to the public um, if they cannot afford to take those out. That's child care, that's membership, et cetera. Um, Non-Wallingford non resident access to the aquatic center. Not the same deal that the, the town of Wallingford residents would get, but they'd have to pay for a full uh, YMCA membership, but they could have access to the aquatic center. And again, these are, these are conceptual ideas. They all have to be ironed out. This is, again, as Chris was mentioning earlier, this is our, our, our first date, um, let's say. Um, Concerns to discuss and next steps. Uh, what if the Y does not raise enough money and how does that happen? Um, what if Inland Wetlands denies the YMCA's request to build an addition in the rear of the building? We've already uh, kind of had to deal with that already and we have an alternative thanks to Sam. Um, and then just in a summary, you know, why should the town council, mayor, residents of, of the town support a partnership such as this? Um, number one, aquatics is a lifelong activity that impacts all ages. Um, Many of you I know are runners. Um, well, guess what, your knees eventually go. And the water is a great activity for you guys to take part in. Uh, organiz organizations partnering together ensures we maximize all resources for its highest and best use. Um, the town and Wallingford YMCA partnership on an indoor aquatic center allows us to, uh, to use our shared resources, collective impact, eliminate duplication and save money. Town of, Town of Wallingford and YMCA have been trusted partners for over 76 years. And the partnership would be greater than just a pool. It would be an investment in the health of the youth, <coughs> adults, and families in the community. If you want to be involved, I just uh, put that out there as a PSA, but um, there's two, two committees that we have that are currently running um, that we would love your guys' input and involvement in. jump to the final screen and um, just want to thank you for your time um, consideration just uh, to have a conversation moving forward and um, and your continued partnership with the YMCA thank you um, do we have questions from the council councillor Lavin thank you uh, thanks for the presentation and I know we've we've had other conversations on the side. Uh, thank you to Councilor Shortel for bringing this forward. Um, as is Councilor Shortel, I'm, I'm intrigued as well. Um, I'm not anywhere close to having any idea of where a decision would come from me on this. Um, I have some questions. Some of them you may have the answers to and some of them you may not. And some of these are just kind of everybody to be thinking about things as conversations continue to occur. You said you've reached 25% of the goal so far, and part of that was due to the state. Do you know how much, how much money is from the state that got you to that goal of the 25%? So the, uh, so the dollar figure was $750,000 okay. from the state, yeah. Is that like a, a grant, or is, is it contingent on anything? You, the Y got the money, and if you don't build a pool, you get to keep the money, or you gotta give it back if you don't? So the, the grant was written uh, that the, um, the, uh, they have to, the, the funds have to be used for projects associated with the east side and west side improvements and okay. enhancements for the community. Okay. 
And then a, the town share, the two million is, if we're going off six million, is a third of the total project, right? Then. Correct, and that, uh, just to keep, keep uh, make sure that every, <laughs> the number is, was a suggestion. Okay. If the project comes in higher, seven or eight million, because uh, we experienced a similar thing with our original pool plans, would would you expect the town share to increase with the increase? So going back, I, you said that was a suggestion. If that's currently a third of the project, if it increases seven or eight million, would you be looking for the town to kick in and maintain its third contribution? No, no. Um, we have uh, we would have the opportunity to basically take a look at the project as a whole, and you know, the, have to grab the value engineering and, and take a look at uh, other options okay. of, uh, from a construction standpoint. The, the fields, I, I'm having trouble visualizing where there's room for, for this center and all the fields. Where on the property, this is over on the west side? Yes. Um, maybe at this point, somebody can point to the map. Um, where, and or help you know, with the orientation here. Right. So all down in that, I, I just assumed it's all wetlands. But So we're looking to flush it out. And have we gotten anywhere beyond conceptual, like I have a, I have a great idea? Do we know if that's even possible or? There is some dry, dry non-wetland area over um, on the river road side. Sam could probably. The, the, uh, the wetlands on the site are uh, indicated in the toned gray areas. Okay. The, the site is somewhat of a mess. Uh, we inherited the site when we bought it in 2019, uh, Sean. And now we're starting to tackle uh, the opportunities that are on the site. It's overgrown. There's a lot of invasive species. Um, it is hard to imagine what can be accomplished in here, but we have determined in this area here that you can place a, a little league ball uh, field. It's tight, but we expect to have an activity area in this zone here. We're hoping to also have activities take place in this area here, and then there'll be a bridge crossing at a wetlands crossing possibly here or possibly here, depending on how it takes place. Our intent is to preserve the wetlands. We've been working with the uh, Inland Wetlands Commission and but what we are also looking to is to provide a complete experience on the site so it's not just the pools there are outdoor activities as well um, any other questions no not for the map thank you um yeah so it's a lot to take in obviously um the concerns off the top of my head are just going through the presentation at which you forwarded in advance, uh, and, and I read through, so I had some notes already to, um, so there is a, there's a demand from your current membership for more aquatics. And, yes. and, I, and that sounds like it's beyond the, I don't want to drive across town. You, they want more, more space. Even if they drove across town, there's not necessarily the supply for that Correct. activity. Correct. Um, so just a general concern then, you may have enough demand or, or and the necessary supply that you're trying to supply for your members alone, let alone adding uh, the, the community in the pool. And how many people, how many residents would actually be able to get in or would we have to put a cap on in the future? Things like that. Um, Correct, I don't have the answer to that question. Right, and I, and I know we won't. But that's, that's why I'm kind of saying these out loud so everybody is kind of th thinking about this and kicking it around and, and the the weeks or months to come, however long this takes. Probably, you know, 20 years based on the way we do everything else. But the, the other thing is the, the Y team. So we have the Y teams, Park and Rec has their own programming. Um, I guess, and this is total difference, if we were to do this, you know, Park Rec commission wise, like how, how much stake or, or opportunity do we have? Would we not have town programs that would utilize the pool in deference to the Y's Program. I mean, you're, you have your own membership, you have your own programs that, that generate re revenue to pay for other programs and help people and things. So would, where would the town's opportunity from the 
our own town services side be to, to use all this? Because I already see this being very busy or filled. So that's just another concern. Again, I know you're not going to have the answers. I would um, just leave it like uh, anything's on the table. Yeah. Um, and, and keep that um, spirit of, of that answer and, and a few others just, just to know that, um, you know, when we met, we had a chance to meet with the Park and Rec Commission and shared the same thing. Um, they asked us uh, what, uh, what did we foresee them doing, right. you know, in partnership. And I said, what would you like to do? Um, that's, that's, you know, let's sit at the table and have a conversation because everything's on the table at this point. Okay. That is all I have uh, for now. You know, the only other thing was, and I'm sure this is another of these conceptual things, is, is the, are the programs that go in, are we, is the town share of the two million and, and the residents having access, is that the end of it or do we become one third owner in revenue generated by the pool? Do we kind of forfeit that to go towards the operation and maintenance of the pool? You know, things like that, I guess I have questions about too, but I, I understand again, you wouldn't have any, any knowledge of that now. Uh, I just, I guess I want to understand, sure. what do we own? Do we own a third of the pool? And is our, our payment just that everybody gets to use it through a separate additional fee? Or are we part of a larger, you know, whether it be a board represented, you know, does the rec and park, park and rec commission have representation on operational use of the pool in a day-to-day -day basis? I don't know, things like that. But. Sure. And Thank just, you. just to answer real quick, your, um, your part on the demand, um, that's, it is a very good question, just, but just to it in perspective right now, we, so we have about 7,500 members. 80% um, of those are from Wallingford. And uh, we serve basically 31% of the uh, Wallingford households, so, uh, one of every three, that kind of thing. Uh, but just, just to put that in perspective as far as the um, increased demand. Do you know how many of them basically belong to the Y so they can use the pool as the primary reason of membership? That I don't would, have. Would you but be that's afraid a good of losing yeah. membership in deference to, well, we're just going to buy the, the pool pass? Do you have a current? Pool pass, you, you, you don't get to use the gym, no, you just, no, you don't. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you it's join all, as a member and you right. get everything. Uh, what's the, what the plan is with the West Side facility with the addition is, um, especially where we put it, where, where, where the addition's being put on right now, we're gonna be able to create a lobby that actually um, can uh, aid in facility access. Yeah. So if you, aquatic center this way, wellness this way, um, and that it could also help with uh, in from using technology in regards to gate access, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah. So, you, but you haven't considered that there could be a potential, it could be cannibalizing part of your membership in deference to towards the pool. Just people just want to swim. They're not going to pay the the Y fee anymore. They're just going to pay the pool pass, and that be it. We um, we do you have a survey that says like how many people are there exclusively just for the pool? We we have. We have polled our, uh, our, our members, yeah. uh, but right now they're, they're so limited in regards to the amount of time they can get in the pool. That's um, hard yeah, to this is gonna be additions, because right now you have a four lane pool and a, warm, a smaller body of more warm, warm water pool. Yeah. Um, we're gonna add another eight lanes, um, plus another warm water pool that has actually three lanes. So at the end of the day, you have about 15 lanes now of availability from a programmatic standpoint and whatnot. This is a lot more, more availability for our membership and the community as well. Okay, thank you, that's it for now. Before I keep talking and think of more questions. Thanks. Councilor Shortell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had some of the same questions top, Councilor Laffin had. I just wanna, you answered one of them, I just wanna clarify. So you said 80% of your members are from Wallingford, so that means you have about 1,500 out of town members, if my math is, is right. Correct. Okay. Um, parking? because this is going in front, potentially, how does that affect parking or do we not know yet until it gets to that? We should have that nailed down probably within the next 60 days or so because that, that with the addition, now, now that we know from uh, wetlands uh, we, where our fate was, whether in front of the building or back of the building, now we're gonna have to reconfigure that parking. Yeah. Um, and we have some options available for us. You guys own the, the part of the lot that's right on River Road. Is that, that's not like a lot that, that you actually own that part too? Correct. Okay, yeah. got it. You okay. The only option, the only, what we don't own is the gas station on the corner. Got it. Okay. Um, 
uh, these questions are kind of disconnected just based on, and I, I mean, I'd already seen this, but I'm just, you know, different. Um, I totally agree with, with what, what uh, Vice Chair Laffin said in terms of really, if this ever were to work, uh, it would have to be, that'd be really specific agreements about usage and availability. Because um, I, I do get to start, you know, I, I, you know, someone buys a pool pass and they get all excited and it's, it's the middle of February and they show up at West Side and they're like, no, you go to the, you go to the East Side to swim. Like, oh, you know, I really wanted to swim in the eight lane pool or I really wanted to go on the little pirate ship thing, you know, in the, the water. So I, I do think that's, that's something, and I don't, I'm not, you know, if, if we get this far, I mean, look, we have, we negotiated power agreements with data centers and CMAC. We have all sorts of stuff. We, we can write, any, anyone can, you know, any, anything can be agreed to. Yeah, but I think less complicated. Yeah. Um, I, I worry about the total cost. And I worry because I, and I, again, Councillor Laffin alluded to this, and, and, and the saga of the pool, it was my, I guess it was the end of my first, so it was in 2017, the end of my first term, when this kind of, we started getting, you know, the presentations, Mr. Golak was here, and we had other people here, and we were gonna get a pool as a, like 13,000 square feet, uh, cubic feet, and it was gonna cost six, six million. And what happened over time was the pool kept shrinking, and the cost kept rising. And, and I think Councilor Fishbein's probably gonna talk about this when I'm done talking, but you know, we wanted six lap lanes, we got four. We wanted the slide, I don't think we got the slide. I mean, the thing that we're all fighting to save with the Save Our Pool, that thing was really skinny down from where it started in 2017. And so my point is not to resurrect that debate. My point is simply that that cost, you know, somebody asked, you know, why did everyone get fixated on six million? Because we were told six million, that's why. We were all, and the mayor was told, we were told, there was a, it's on YouTube. There was a meeting from like four years ago this month where we were sort of said, you can have this great pool. And it wasn't Parks and Rec saying that. I'm saying it was a, someone else that came in said that. And then the, the price kept going up. So, so I guess I, when I look at this, I see on the, the picture, you know, it looks like one of those stadiums. You got the glass and it's going to press a button and the, the roof's going to open up. And I'm like, man, and that's going to cost less than this tiny pool that we're going to build over to replace the big pool. So I'm just trying to reconcile that. And I hope it's true. And I have to, I, I want to go to Milford, you know, to, to see yeah. Milford. But that's what scares me a little bit about this is that how, how are we going to, how are you guys going to build that for, for significantly less than, than this really small community pool that's, we're talking about building down uh, on North Main Street extension. But that's just me bloviating. Um, Sheehan pool. Is there an opportunity here to work, you know, we talked about the three pools you would have in the future state. Could Sheehan pool be part of that mix? And, and I would challenge the, 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 us as a council and Parks and Rec, even if this, you know, this doesn't go anywhere, Sheehan pool. Let's, use, let's go back to using Sheehan pool. We have millions of dollars in the bank. I think we can bring Sheehan back. Whatever happens here, let's bring Sheehan back. I used to go swimming there in the winter as a kid. Um, but anyway, that's just something else to weave in. Because I mean, the high schools could use, in a future state, in theory, we could free up Sheehan, we could make that part of a rotation. Um, that's just a thought. Anyway, um, but this is, I mean, this is, this is very intriguing. I'll defer to, to others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Y. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm merely a sauna steam room member. Um, I, point of order. But anyway. No, point of order. I just, I just need to say this. I saw him pre-COVID at the Y, and he was, wa he was walking backwards on a treadmill. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He was like doing shadow boxing. Uh, anyway, I just wanted everyone to know that. That, that was out of order. Well, since COVID, I've built like the best gym possible. In fact, Sean, my, my leg press got delivered today, so I want to get home to like use my leg press. But anyway, um, you know, it's sort of ironic, or I don't even know if that's the right adjective, um, that we end up here because, you know, Sean, you and I, before the pool thing even started, had the talk about public private partnership on the existing site where the community pool was. And, and I was disappointed all through the discussions, the many meetings that we had, that that never came up for whatever reason, and I didn't want to say anything. So it's, it's a little weird that we're here 
at this point. I am concerned about the parking, the usage. I, you know, I know at certain times that parking lot with the present usage is sometimes pretty damn full. And now if we're gonna take up a significant amount of it with this aqua center, which is gonna not only take traffic from east side to west side, but also I would think bring people in from other towns to see our beautiful new facility or your beautiful new facility. Parking is gonna be an issue, but you know, Sam's a professional and I'm sure you know, you'll be able to address that accordingly. But I am concerned, so. We, we have another number of options on the site and one of the options that was actually uh, pointed out by uh, our civil engineer, Chris Giuliano, is the possibility of closing off the access, which is quite cumbersome to Hartford Turnpike, and using only the River Street access, which would provide a uh, intersection which would meet the traffic at the corner of Hartford Turnpike and River Street. River Street is the on-ramp, off-ramp, but it's actually technically uh, a town street also. And so uh, we would be able to capture a significant number of spaces on the west side of the existing, uh, west side of the new addition, uh, where it is uh, squandered by a large ramp access point down to the uh, to the facility. So if I was coming from the, um, the central fire station area down yes. the hill and I wanted to access the site and Hartford Turnpike was blocked off, I would have to take a right on River Road. That is correct. And then hopefully there's no traffic that's exiting the Merritt Parkway there. There will always be traffic exiting the Merritt Parkway. But if you look at the, uh, the site plan, you can see the gas station which is a pie-shaped element in the corner. And there is a fairly wide uh, parking area that actually fronts onto River Street. And the uh, determination or the design of the traffic flow would utilize that as the main access to the, uh, to the site. No, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the parking lot. Okay. I, and you know, I recognize that, I'm just. We had actually, we'd actually hoped to put the the addition on the back of the building um, and preserve as much of the parking as we could. But we do believe that this is a viable option uh, to doing it and it has that secondary effect that uh, now the traffic that uses the site can be metered um, at the intersection of River and Hartford Turnpike. Okay, and then the other thing, um, looking at is a portion of the colored area overlay of the existing building? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, okay, so the, the lower section is the studio, the workout big room with the wooden floor, correct? The, right. the gray area in this particular drawing, or the tan area, on the right-hand side below the blue area is, in fact, uh, exercise rooms uh, in the what they or the low roof section of the existing facility. Yes, that's where like the ab room used to be yes. and, and that kind of stuff. So now... And this is why we're uh, uh, hoping to put that addition on the back. In this scheme, it is shown as larger than we believe we will uh, ultimately need. Uh, in discussions with wetlands, the final scheme has that addition on the west side of the facility uh, slightly smaller and it simply is an expansion of a previously approved addition on the west side of the facility. Well, I, w yeah, when I first began, I came over from HealthWorks, you yeah. know, originally, and that's how I got to the Y. Well, yeah, that's how I got to the Y, and they said that they had the approval at that time. But, you know, my concern from there is, you know, I know that that room, as it presently exists, pre-COVID, because I haven't been there since COVID physically, you know, for yoga and stuff, it was pretty full. Yeah. So now if you're gonna move that activity to the rear of the building, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're gonna be able to service that. You know, I leave that up to you. I'm just throwing those things out here because this is sort of like a discussion, but. We really haven't got into the programming phase and uh, how the circulation works. Uh, Sean did uh, intimate some of the details over needing to separate uh, flow for pool only users and the full Y members uh, who have access to the entire facility 
there would be, as uh, Sean pointed out, a lobby in the uh, crutch of the L of the new addition and the existing building, and that would give us an opportunity to completely rework the front facade of the building, which needs all the help it can get at this point. Yeah, um, I, I guess a concern also from the River Road thing is then if you're going to make that the access way, I think you're going to lose uh, a level of existing parking there also. But the, uh, the, the parking is very efficient, inefficiently laid out yeah. at this point, and uh, we will be uh, tuning it uh, to provide what's needed. And then um, two other things. The pool on the east side would, would remain? Four-lane pool, correct. Okay, and um, the concept, because I understand that's all we're talking about, the financial aspect here, in exchange for a contribution from the town, residents would still be required to pay a fee to get the pass? We would, um, the concept is to uh, sell a pool pass or a monthly, daily, monthly, or annual pool pass similar to if you were to go to the community pool. Um, that's the concept to keep it in the same kind of pricing mechanism as, uh, as a um, 40 $50 pool tag. And, we would, and basically that's for the entire summer, we would have a charge it on a monthly basis. Or it's $10 a visit, it's, uh, but we're still working out the details on the pricing. But the game plan is to get it as close to so the, re the town residents don't see a, a major difference from a, f a financial side of things. And then if you can't afford it, of course, we have financial assistance available. No, I, I understand, but time value of money. So if I pledge to you $2 million today, you're going to get benefit from that. You're going to get, you're going to be able to fundraise off of that, right? We're so much further towards getting right. this thing done, right? So yep. you're, you're benefiting from that day one. Um, you know, I would just have passes to Wallingford residents. You know, I mean, we've paid our money, as far as I'm concerned, under that concept. Um, so not that I'm in favor of this, we're talking, um, but, you know, that's how I feel right now. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Marone. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So. I guess I'd like to echo uh, Councilors Laffin and Shortell on the, I, I think a lot of this comes down to the, what the specific particulars of the agreement are. Um, so on the, the, in the first couple of slides, you had $10 million in work that you're looking to do in the Y sort of in total. And I understand $6 million of this is, the, is this project. You've raised $2 million. You're looking for two from us. So even just to get this portion done, you're, you're still looking at raising another $2 million. Correct. Your timeline was to begin construction potentially in April, this coming April, correct? Correct. So that's a pretty short timeline then to raise the extra $2 million um, for April. I guess I'm looking for you to comment on how likely do you think it is that you're going to be able to, that seems like a, you know, you have 7,500 members, it's like 500 bucks a member, and 7,500 I presume means like men, women, and children, right? It's not like 7,500 families. total okay. membership, yeah. So that's like 500 bucks a family, like give or take, or per person rather, give or take. So how likely do you think you are to raise the $2 million by April? Um, our goal, uh, we have a, yeah, uh, Top ten, top one hundred, uh, a list of uh, major gifts. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we don't, we intend to go back and put it out to uh, members, but it's voluntary as far as donations go. Um, but we have a specific uh, list that we're uh, working with our fundraising team um, to cont cultivate and um, kind of bring home some um, uh, donations in that regards. Um, we've already raised, uh, in addition to what we've, we've done about say a good three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars worth of renovations and expansion to or to east side renovations um, that was also raised already uh, plus the addition to 1.3 that we've that we have for this project as well so we'll continue that um, progression uh, as far as the fundraising side of things we were doing very well until COVID hit, and then we said wait a second this these projects got to be put on hold we got to worry about, about survival first um, so we're, we were just trying our best to pick it up where we left off uh, and continue having those conversations with folks. The state grant um, definitely got you, you know, as, as Craig alluded to, um, the state grant got us uh, additional funding uh, from ad other folks that said, okay, this is going to happen. Um, I, I can perceive that uh, a, a town contribution would also do the same as well. 
uh, from the, this is gonna get, this is gonna happen and it can't happen soon. So th this body generally moves very slowly, unless you're, you know, unless it's a data center or something specific, but um, what would be the drop dead date by which you would need a commitment from the town then in order to make this project happen? I don't, I don't think I have that answer for you today. Um, typically, um, in, a, in a capital campaign ran, run by a nonprofit, usually you get five-year gifts. Um, you know, so let's say if you give us $50,000, 10000 a year for five years. So when, in order to do, a, do the project before the five years is up and before we collect it all, we end up, we get a bridge loan uh, to work on that. So that we would be working with our bank in regards to how to, how to bring it, how to, how to get it done sooner than later. Uh, in that regards, but as it, as it relates to this, uh, this partnership and this collaboration, we've got a lot of, way, a lot, a lot of room to go. Um, I don't want to rush it. Uh, we want to make sure we cro uh, cross every I, dot every T, mm. um, but we want to make sure that um, at the end of the day, uh, this, this works and this feels right for you guys as mm -hmm. well as us. No, I appreciate it. And just so, so you understand where I'm coming from. Sure. Understood. You know, having all the town, like opening it up to the whole town is a lot of wear and tear in your facility. So I'm just trying to understand the, you know, your side of the equation and that is why, you know, what, what, what are you giving up or why would you engage in this partnership with the town? And obviously, you know, it's advertising, good advertising for the why and you get people to use the facility. I'm just trying to see it from, uh, from all sides here. So. Um, we're, just, we're doing so many programs and collaborations together um, and, and I've mentioned this to a couple of folks that um, it should be almost shame on us if we didn't reach out to you guys and say, you want to be a part of this? And, that, and that's kind of what we're doing today, is to say, um, we've got an exciting project. Um, there's an, a demand, an aquatics demand. Um, do you want to be a part of it? All right, thank you so much. Sure. Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, I, I'm still just trying to get over the trauma of picturing Councillor Fishbein shadow boxing backwards in a sauna. So. Once I get through that, I still can't even think straight. Um, but on a serious note, I be blunt. I have no um, aversion to working with the Y on a partnership in principle. However, I'm not interested or willing to consider anything until a community pool is built. That's where I'm coming from. And if I knew that there was a commitment on the part of the administration and the town to proceed and do the renovation of community pool, as we all have approved, and then there was somehow uh, a creative presentation made as to how we could also participate in this partnership financially, I'd be open to hear that because I do see the benefits of all this. I do not, um, I do not have any favorable feelings about this as a replacement or an, a long-term alternative to community pool. Um, I'm not questioning you on your timing, um, but it, it seems like if we were to move forward with this, according to the time frame you've presented, that pretty much gets us so far away from doing community pool uh, with the current leadership we have that I don't see us ever doing it. And that's not acceptable to me personally. Um, and we were just fought for a half hour about $100,000 for asphalt. And suddenly we're talking about the possibility of coming up with $2 million when we have, we didn't, we won't do the pool. We have all these other things. I'm, I'm the first one to say I want to do all this stuff, and then I'm usually told we have to look at financial realities. And well, today, $2 million or plus uh, for a project such as this, while there's too much else not done, um, is something I can't, I can't go along with. We do community pool. We get the commitment to, to do that renovation. Um, I see this as something we, that I would be more than open to talk further about. But negotiating details about it now is just too premature for me personally. But thank you. Understood. Thanks. Um, before we go to the public, I, I think that um, I, the devil is in the details. 
you know, if, if there's going to be an investment by the town, um, the, the question is preserving uh, the benefit for the town residents and the use that's commensurate with the town's investment. And, um, you know, the, preserving the programming that Park and Rec uh, w would um, typically have available to it. Um, it's, this is the kind of thing that uh, before you're going to get any commitment from anyone, it, it really has to make sense in terms of what, what the return is on the investment. So in that, I think there's obviously a variety of different ideas up here, and it'll be interesting to see how we flesh that all out. Um, are there any comments from the public? Gentlemen, just standing up, your name and address for the record, please. My name is Hank Hoffman. I live at Carr Street. And I just wanted to get up and echo what Councillor Testa said. This sounds very interesting. It would certainly have the advantage of being year-round uh, versus the community pool, which is a summer uh, available during the summer. But I would not want to see the town invest. It would seem to me if the town was putting $2 million to this, the community pool renovation would never happen. Now, I had experience uh, being a, a member of the Y in the early 2000s when I couldn't run or walk for exercise, and I used their pool there for lap swimming, and I was glad to have it. Eventually, I gave it up because <coughs> it ended up I have it, having to share the lane too much, and obviously part of this is an attempt to address that, and also the lack of, there were too many times when other programming was preventing me from using the pool. Uh, several years ago, when I again couldn't walk for exercise, I went back to the community pool, and experientially, it was a much better thing. It was outside, it was in the natural light, um, it was actually enjoyable, whereas the lap swimming for me was good for my health, but not otherwise enjoyable at, uh, at the Y. But my biggest concern is that with limited town funds, that the community pool, which is a, a jewel of the town, and is like a beach, and is uh, you know the type of thing that's sort of quirky and type of thing that imprints on memories of your kids being there and everything, that we would lose that. The town would just sort of give up on, on, on doing that. And, and uh, I'd be concerned that this would end up being sort of a privatization of the community pool or the, the function of the community pool in the town. So I, I'm glad uh, to hear what Councillor Testa said. Um, if the town goes ahead with refurbishing the community pool, um, then I would think that if we could do this, then I'd be happy to, to see the town you know, talk and partner with the Y on this. But to me, the community pool is the priority. And uh, if we were to go ahead with this now, I would say that we would not ever do the community pool. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Michael. Evening. Uh, Jason Michael, Meadow Street. And if the council will allow, I'm going to speak with a couple of hats. Um, if I need to circle back, if I've gone over time and come up again, I will. But uh, I am the um, unaffiliated chairman of a uh, primarily politically disinterested Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, and and um, I just have a few questions. Um, as And, and I, first, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Shortheimer, rather, uh, Shortel, for bringing this <laughs> to... Uh, to the forefront and saving it from circling the drain of the many forums on Facebook. Um, there's been some wild numbers thrown out there and, and some crazy accusations, but um, I believe the money invested so far, just as a, a point alone, uh, is $477,000 in the community pool project. We've heard half a million, 700,000, but that's what it is, so everybody, everybody knows. Um, my questions as the, as the, the chair, um, and it probably can't, the first one probably can't be answered, but assuming the town says, yeah, we're, you know, we're for this, can we assume or, or not that this money would, if it's going to be that fast-tracked, is this money being considered going to be taken from the possibility of this community pool project, which finds itself in a torturous stasis and seemingly unending at this point as we are in the dark as a, as a commission and committee as to whether or not this is going to happen or does it need to be revisited 
monetarily or, 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 or on the size of the project. With that being said, I, I found it interesting that I watched the debate on a parking lot where the project is being argued to go back out to bid or not. And uh, we had had a meeting back in June with the mayor and we asked simply just to have the project go back out to bid to test the waters. And, um, and uh, we weren't ultimately able to do that. And I'm curious if that changed the, 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 the policy or, or, or preference of sending these things back out to bid or not. That just confused me a bit. Um, but, but secondly, um, does the why locally or nationally intend to, to provide any funds outside of fundraising? In other words, is there a war chest that will be tapped with their own interests involved? If, and you don't have to answer. I'm, I'm just, it's just a, out of curiosity. So you just want to ask questions and let yeah. them linger in the air? Yeah. That's okay. A, that's your project. For dramatic effect, I figure you're on a stage. Maybe you guys can go with that. Um, also, if, um, if both pools are ultimately built, and I guess this will be rhetorical as well, if both pools are built, um, is the Y still interested in the partnership that would allow townspeople to swim even though there is a community pool? It's another question I think it would maybe down the road is for answering. I don't want to put anybody on the spot like you said. Uh, and the quick hat change will be Jason Michael, 81 Meadow Street, citizen of Wallingford. And um, I'd like to take a second just to have, have you guys up there imagine yourself in a house that's Wallingford. And I'm coming up to your door and I'm knocking on it. And I got this great plan to build a store on your property, uh, tax-free. I'm going to build this store. And I have two minority partners who are willing to invest, and you being the majority partner at this point. The reward for these minority partners will be they get to sell their wares in this store of mine in your backyard. Your reward is you get to come shop there for the majority of the money that this store is being built. Now would anybody, and you don't have to answer, but would anybody take that deal if I knocked on your door when your house has drafty windows and potholes in the driveway and, and doors that creak? I don't think anybody would. I don't know if anybody would here. And I think that just puts it in kind of a quick little focus as to what's kind of being asked here. And you are Wallingford's house. And I think we can certainly examine where $2 million could or should go uh, that would reward everyone, everyone in town. And then again, that's me as a, as a citizen here, not representing the commission in any way with that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you have a question, or did, were you just standing? Why don't you come up, your name and address for the record, please. I'm getting my back ready to stand. Uh, Danielle Lutz, 57 North Street. Question for the YMCA. You guys already had your meeting with Parks and Rec? Okay, yep. Uh, the question I had, because I'm concerned also about the parking, um, I would love, I mean, I think this is a great idea, but obviously a lot of questions um, need answering. The question I have for Parks and Rec, you said currently your membership, 80% are Wallingford residents. Park and Rec, did they give you a figure on how many residents are actually utilizing the community pool when it was open? Did they give you those numbers yet? Uh, no, I did not get those. Okay. Because to me, that would obviously need to be looked at because if you already have 80% of Wallingford residents utilizing YMCA's membership, I would imagine we need to find out, well, how many of the residents actually utilized the community pool versus how many out-of-state residents also utilized the community pool when it was open to see if this new facility could even sustain that amount of individuals that would be open to the idea of using this aquatic facility. Um, so that's the comment that I wanted to throw out there just so that we had those numbers as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ma'am in the back, if you could come up and give us your name and address for the record. Carol Forte, Parker Street. Um, I had a question for the Y. You said that this pool will be built brand new from the ground up with the intent of lasting 50 years into the future. The proposal said you have a 25-yard pool. 
My question is, if this is supposed to go into the future, why did you choose a 25-yard pool rather than an Olympic-sized pool? Um, good question. We got the um, uh, we got a lot of requests for a um, Olympic pool, um, but we could do a lot with the 25-yard. Uh, plus, it comes down to a cost. So, uh, Olympic pool, 50 meter, that kind of thing. That is a, a very expensive investment. That that alone, that eight-lane pool at 50 meters would be $5 million in itself, uh, let alone the rest of the facility and whatnot. So it really came down to cost. I wasn't depending. sure if it was cost or if it was space or it was a member preference, because I think 25 yards is like old fashioned. That's what I swam in the 1970s kind of thing. Yeah. You know? sure. just, to, just to answer that question with regards to the 25 yard versus uh, you know, 50 meter pool, uh, the majority of, um, you know, children that are competing or are learning to swim are doing so in a 25-yard pool, at least here in the state of Connecticut. Most of the pools that children swim competitively at are the 25-yard pools. Um, that's what we call the short course season, and that is typically the longest part of any swim team. Um, and they're most, most of the kids are, are participating in a 25-yard pool. Not that that's the sole focus of this particular pool, um, but as Sean indicated, a 50-meter pool is a very expensive um, and it is most of our, most of the universities in, in the state of Connecticut have um, even 25 yard pools. We have a few in the state that are 50 meter pools. They're, they're very, they're very rare um, and for obvious reasons, but I do think that the other consideration is size, cost, and everything else. So um, it's you. not old fashioned, so they, they still use them. <laughs> I, okay, I wasn't sure and sure. I just was wondering about going into the future and what your reason was for choosing it. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, one of the specs for the pool itself, that eight lane pool, is we're uh, looking to hopefully add in a diving uh, program to that pool. So the depth on that pool will include enough to be uh, for diving. Name and address for the record, please, Mr. Uh, Savinelli. Mike Savinelli, 27 Rolling Meadow Drive from Wallingford. I'm also on the Park and Rec Commission, and I've been chairing this pool committee for five years now. It started in 2017. I just want to make a comment to the town council. You guys voted yes for this pool, uh, and we were on our way. And then the pandemic hit, and the mayor vetoed. And I understand his concerns. We have been knocking our head against the wall. We have been extremely frustrated. We can't get any answers. And here we sit talking about doing another project when our project has been stalled and we've been jerked around, and we can't get any answers where we're going forward. We wanted to rebid this back in June. No, 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 no foul, no harm, rebid it, see where we are. And we were refused to be able to do that. And to push this thing another year, we're gonna be looking at even more money. So, you know, my issue is we got five years of time into this pool, almost a half a million dollars of taxpayers' money, and I'm not saying this is a bad idea, but I think we have to take care of what's in house first before we make any decisions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morgenstein. I see your hand. Larry Morgenstein, South Main Street. Uh, there's two things I want to ask. Uh, I stepped out, but uh, my first question would go to the mayor. When we were talking about the community pool project, that would have been bonded out. Where would this two million from the taxpayers come from? At this point, I don't have an answer for you. Because we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to bond on a capital project that's not on our own. So would be taking out a lump sum from one of our funds. Would there be a tax increase, lump sum? one-time tax increase to pay for this? Where would that two million all of a sudden appear from? At this time, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to do is that I know that there is a number of people that wrote to the council and it's important that the public knows that there's people that still can't come here because of concerns for COVID. They have children at home, can't be here. So if I could, I'd like to read at least one of their letters into the record. Dear counselors, as soon as the YMCA plan was announced, I had a bit, a lot of skepticism. 
Every day this summer, on the way back from summer camp at the Y, my kids, seven and 10, would ask why we couldn't go to the community pool to cool off. My answer, the mayor stopped the project from going forward. How awful is that, that I have to tell my kids this? Wallingford doesn't need to invest $2 million more million on top of the 600K, but we'll amend that to the 473 that was stated before. We have already spent on engineering plans on a community pool for a pool that will not belong to the community. The pool the Y is planning will be their pool. Make no mistake about that. We need to move forward with the plans for the community pool in its current location. Our town has dilapidated facilities for the youth who live here. The community pool has been closed for two seasons now, and add in 2022 since it's beyond repair sitting there. Doolittle Park is too dangerous for parents and caregivers to bring their kids in the afternoon. What does Wallingford have to offer younger families? I look on with envy at towns like Middletown. While they move forward with their pool renovation plans, Wallingford will be getting $13 million from the federal government for COVID relief, a half of which has already been deposited. We are well within our right to use a portion of this money towards the community pool. But the mayor is also dragging his heels on hiring someone who is well versed in this area and can help plan the spending. We only have a short time to use this money and then it's gone. Please take a stand for your community, for the youth in this town, for the people that are elected to represent and vote no on this proposal and motion to move forward with the community pool renovation. And this is from Sandy Stork, Staffordshire Commons Drive. And there was other people that wrote in too and I think it's important that the community knows that even if people are not here speaking, there is a lot of feelings, investment uh, in the outer community about what community pool means to them, what they'd like it to me mean in the future. And just to be clear, I'm a long time continuing member of the Y. I love the Y. I'm there now that my health is restored almost every other day, if not every day working out. So I support the Y, it's great, but the Y serves a certain amount of different masters and they do a lot of good. Community pool is dedicated to one thing and one thing only, and that's the residents, so thank you. We have time for one more speaker. Um, you wanna defer? Ms. Mashinsky, Mr. O'Connell has deferred his time to you. Mr. O'Connell. Um, Mary Mashinsky from uh, 188 South Cherry Street in Wallingford. And I worked very hard to uh, get these funds, 750000 with the delegation for YMCA. And the reason we worked on that, it took us two years, but the reason we did that was we believe in the YMCA's mission. They've done tremendous work with uh, daycare and uh, helping kids live a safe life and drug-free life. And uh, they've just so benefited the health of the community. However, uh, it wasn't done to, to put the community pool out of commission. It was done to help the Y strictly. And I grew up here, we all, my family all learned to swim here at community, community pool. My, two of my sisters were lifeguards there. Um, my kids learn to swim there as well. And it really is a wonderful pool and a special, a special thing that benefits Wallingford people that most other towns don't have. And not everybody in Wallingford can have a backyard pool. We did not, um, my family did not. That was our local hangout where you could go to the beach with your other families in your neighborhood and uh, and really a community presence. So I am just beseeching that we not, if we consider this deal with the YMCA, that we do not put to bed or kill off community pool. That's, that's a separate question. And I hope to see the community pool resurrected. YMCA deserves uh, to expand their facility. They do a great job, but um, please don't let their success mean that you will not consider 
resurrecting community pool, which is a real special thing that Wallingford has that very few towns have to benefit from. Thank you. Mr. O'Connell, you have 79 seconds. Thank you, I'll try to speak as quickly as I can, I guess, then. Uh, Riley O'Connell, 30 Northford Road, please. Um, I guess the main question I have would be to the mayor, and is that, does he, in, uh, do you intend to put the commu community pool back out to bid at some point in the near or distant future? I think that time will come uh, when we are out of the orders of pandemic and the fear that seems to be prevalent that uh, it will return and uh, cause other health problems. So that at least has to be behind us. I think uh, I don't want to repeat a lot of the stuff that was already uh, said here tonight, but like many other people here, I learned how to swim at Community Pool. It was my first uh, or one of my first jobs in high school as a lifeguard there. So it is a really important resource for folks, but I want to echo what Councillor Tessa said, and I'm really, <coughs> honestly, I think it's a great comparison to the discussion we had earlier today about the parking lots, where here we have two options, a private, ent a private option and a public one, in terms of what the town's going to fund and get done. And I feel really bad for the why folks who are here tonight, because this, I don't think anyone here doesn't think this is a fantastic idea. It's just a matter of, we want reassurances that our community pool is going to be built first, and it's just unfortunate in terms of the timing that it, this idea came, unrelated, I'm sure, at the same time that we're currently dealing with the languishing community pool project that we have uh, going on now. Um, so I'm hoping that's something we can prioritize in terms of getting done, certainly sooner rather than later. And I promise my very only remaining request is that we can find some way for Councillor Shortell, when he's soon to be citizen Shortell, now that he's a community pool expert, that you can still call him here on a bi-weekly basis to, uh, or every two weeks to uh, answer your questions. So, thank you. Yeah, he doesn't want to be here every other week. <laughs> I know that already. Um, we have some follow-up questions from the council. Councillor Laffin. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I meant to ask this before, and I didn't. If the town doesn't participate, does your project go forward, or do you need the town to make this happen, your pool? We're full steam ahead. Okay. Yeah. That was it. Councilor Shortell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I think it, I agree with this. We should build both. This is not a, a either an either or, and this is what I was saying at the outset, is let's be creative. What if the town gives, I mean, Sean put out two million, what if the town gives 500,000? What if the town, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities we have to work out in addition to the logistics. Um, but I just want to remind everyone, I feel like, because the gentleman came up before to, and gave a great talk about how he, he went to community pool, the experience, the beach, that community pool is, is gone. Like if the thing that we voted on that we passed, that Mr. Savinelli talked about, that's not that pool. I just want you to realize, I feel like that, that, that we're thinking that that pool is coming back. The pool that's coming, that you all want to build, that we want to build, five of us wanted to build it, is like going to fit in the section that never is never open. That section closer to North Main Street extent. That's the footprint of the pool. Now it's going to have a splash pad. It's going to have other great, it's going to be a more of a, a multi-purpose park. It's a great design. I love the design. But, but make no mistake, the big beach that we all grew up on, I took swimming lessons there in the 70s. Yes, I'm that old. Um, that's gone. That's gone now. So I just don't want anyone to have any illusions. Go to um, West Hartford. There's a couple of pools in West Hartford that they have. That, that's what we're going to have in Wallingford. That's close to what we're going to have in Wallingford. And I forget the names of the... I went there the winter... Like right before COVID, I took pictures. I sent to the council. It was like the January, December of 19. Um, they're nice. They're nice, tiny little pools with four lap lanes. So just that cost $7.4 million a year and a half ago. It's not getting cheaper. And I have no, and, and I just want to make one other point. You know, you had a, you have five counselors who voted for the pool to override the veto. You're losing two of them. Jason and I won't be up here. I don't know who will be on the council. Maybe you'll get, 
you know, more counselors who will be for it. But I have, I don't know who will be on the council if this comes back, so I would not assume council support. And I don't know what it's going to cost when it comes back. And finally, I would just add that a lot of us, of the five of us, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I feel like some of us held our noses a little bit when we voted yes, because we wanted six lap lanes. We didn't get six lap lanes. We wanted the slide. We didn't get the slide. We got the slide. Oh, we got the slide. Oh, that's awesome. All right. We got the slide. But we didn't get the lap lanes. And then we were told it was $200,000, I think, for the, for, the, for the two extra lap lanes and planning and zoning have to get involved. And we didn't get the band, the, the, the performance shell. We didn't get the equipment. There was stuff in that original design. So I just, I'm just pointing that all out. And I'm not saying it's, we shouldn't do it. We should do it. But um, I don't want to see this language languish either. I want, to, I want to see it all happen. But anyway, those are my comments. And I saw Councillor Fishbein walking backward on a treadmill, not in a sauna. I want to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking the steam out of the experience. <laughs> Councillor Zandri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, Councillor Shortell, you, you had to be taking those lessons in the late 70s because I took them in the early 70s. Yeah, I was going to say. I, I too, used community pool as, as, a, as a youth, and that's where I learned to swim as well. And my comments are probably going to be less on the the pool itself and more on how things work up here because there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of pleading even to the council. And I just want to kind of reiterate to everybody that the, how, how the process of things work here, just as a reminder, for even, even for the community pool project, even in the consideration of what we may or may not do at the Y with these projects, we have a strong form of mayoral government here in the town, for better or for worse. Now, depending on the side of the argument that you're on, that, again, it's either going to be a positive or a negative for you. Um, even earlier in the meeting, the best we could do on the paving was to vote on a resolution. It technically only means a show of support here to the administration that we would like to get that paving done. The mayor makes the, the mayor's office, Mayor Dickinson and the administration makes the ultimate decision. And that's the form of government that we've got. And I bring this up to stress it because we're going into an election. If you like the way that things are, then, we, then, then remember that when you go to vote. And I only bring this up because of what Councilor Shortell identified. We, there were five of us up here that voted to support community pool. We passed the budget for it, to go out to bid, to do the work. The administration ended that. We tried to override it. The same five people came back, and it's not enough to override a veto. And two of us are going to be gone. It's important that all of you remember that. We, we all have different passions on what we want to see for the town. And I'm not going to allude to the fact that a public-private partnership would be the worst thing in the world. We already have this as an example in Simpson Court parking, something that I, I will freely admit that I've been against almost my whole time sitting up here and before I ever got here 10 years ago. Because I feel like there's enough parking for the public. The same would be true for this type of a private partner public-private partnership, before we do anything, and this is not a thing on the why. I, I don't want to make it a point. I don't care whether it's the swimming pools at the why, parking somewhere else. We should be tending to our own stuff first. We're spending tax dollars outside of our stuff, whatever that stuff might be, pool, parking lot, building, I don't care. I hope that whoever sits up in some of these chairs come this November remembers that. The they're the stewards of the taxpayer dollars. All of you folks out there, you're the taxpayers. You should want us taking care of our things before we go into a, a public-private partnership with anybody for anything. I don't care how much of a benefit it's going to be for the town. So. I would love to see a project like this come to fruition someday after 
community pool is taken care of properly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Morgenstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jason, you really hit the nail on the head and said it all as did others. Um, I just want to say a thank you to our Recreation Commission. A lot of them are here in the back. Um, John Golak, who now works for Cheshire Recreation Department. Um, I think, what, two prior committees before the current pool project committee, how long this pool had needed to be improved, and it took a third plan that we are now sitting stagnant on. Um, you guys are meeting again tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. I've attended some of those meetings. I presume that your heads are once again together and talking about all things that really matter to this town on your own time and giving of yourselves. Um, it's sad that this body has what, this will be our third if we decided to say we want to make a statement that we want um, our pool project. We would, we're becoming a, a council of resolutions. We're powerless up here. I, I'm impressed at how many people are here in the room tonight. Um, with the pandemic, I did not expect. I'm sure there would have been many more, and there are many more at home. And again, yeah, Sean, um, all three of you, very much supportive. It's a grand project, and the Y is a fabulous um, commodity in our community. Um, but here we are, and here we are, and um, we need that empty, how many acres is our community pool? Um, it's not, like Chris pointed out, it's not just a pool. Um, it's a large piece of land that is sitting and rotting, and we as a town can't, can't have this. We, we, need, we need better. Thank you, everybody, who's worked so hard. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shortell, I'll give you the last stab at this. I just want to, uh, well, thank you, Sean, and, and everyone. Thank you, Courtney, and everyone for coming, and everyone else for coming out, whether you're for it or against it. I, I appreciate that. I guess I want to know what the next steps are. Are there, I think that there's, I don't know, what are the next steps? Can, can who can, you know, the council had questions, you know. Actually, if you could give us a minute, Councillor Tata apparently oh. was trying to get my attention, but I, I will, re I will yield to Councillor Tata. There was Sorry, steam was gonna, talk or something. I, I was going to get the last word, maybe, but I guess not. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I just thank you for the presentation, and um, it's a lot to think about. And thank you for everybody who commented. I think um, I think I'm just trying to have a really open mind about this, and I'm, I'm some of the things going through my head are just I. We've been talking about the size of the community pool. Um, I'm hoping this isn't an either or. I think we can maybe maybe make both work. Um, I know my big concern with the the community pool design was that I thought the pool was was very small, and I know that that the commission looked at numbers and and thought it was the appropriate prize uh, size, but for the cost for 7.4 million dollars, I think a lot of people were would have shown up there and and been shocked that it was that small. Um, but there were also other amenities that were going to be very nice. So um, what I'm thinking now is if everybody kind of keeps an open mind and maybe we can compromise and maybe maybe community pool ends up having the really, really great splash pad that a lot of people have said they wanted and maybe it just has a scaled down lap pool and then maybe the YMCA has this project and um, there might be an option to bypass it either. Maybe some people prefer the to have the indoor option or to um, just use that facility and maybe a lot of people um, would prefer to use community pool. Um, so I, I think we can maybe work out a, a hybrid situation and hopefully that would, would save the town and the taxpayers money in the long run. Um, so again, I know this is very early, but just an idea of some, some thoughts I'm having uh, just from hearing everything. So thank you to everyone involved. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councillor Shortell. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, which just begs the question. I mean, what about something like where we started 
on this. Um, you know, if the administration is adverse to the pool, is there some thought about your concept on our property um, with some sort of agreement? I mean, based upon the numbers that I'm seeing, it's cheaper. It's better. Um, I mean, I, I suppose that may be a way to get there. You don't have all the site improvements that, you know, you don't have the parking issue that we've talked about. So, I mean, this is all part of thinking outside the box, right? Um, but certainly, you know, if we were to lease you the property that's, I guess, based upon the current plan would be vacant um, with some sort of agreement that town residents can use it, there may be a different way of looking at that. So. I just want to throw that out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you once again for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shortell, back to you. I, I was just trying to wrap, wrap this up and get next steps. So who does what? Like, who talks to whom? Um, because, I mean, how do we do this? Do we, Mayor, do they work through you to come up to, to just flesh out what this could look like? No one's not, not approved. It's not approved. It's not anything. It's just a, it's a potential thing. Or is it, like, where does it go from here? Does I just want to... Before we end, I just don't want to leave it, you know. From my perspective, it's a programming issue. If there's a need for programming year-round swimming, then this is an avenue to pr provide that. But it comes back to recreation. What, what, is, what is the programming that would benefit the community of Wallingford? And it grows from that. If there's no, no real need for year-round swimming, if there aren't that many people interested in it, then that's an answer to the question. If there really is a need, then, then that needs to be addressed. And then how does a community pool fit into that larger picture? But it's a programming question. Do you think it's a legal? I agree with that. Do you think it's also a legal question? So there's all these sort of, in addition to the programming aspect, there's all the, you know, how would it, how would it theoretically work? You know, what happens to the money? What ha how do we guarantee, how does the town guarantee its, its usage? So I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out where does Sean go after tonight? Who does he talk to, like, to work out? You know what I mean? Like, does he talk to you? Does he talk to, to Kenny? Does he talk to Janice Small? I'm just trying to get, like, a I, next I, I think step. it's with it's with recreation. Okay. It's with recreation to determine what, what recreational facilities are advisable to have and what programs will they provide. If it's a partnership with a Y, then ultimately there is a contractual issue. What does that contract say? who has authority to make decisions, who makes final decisions, um, the financing would follow after that. But ulti ultimately, it's a programming issue. Okay. That's the first, that's the first. I, I mean, recreation step. doesn't want to do this. Well, we but, just had the chair of the commission get up and say he doesn't want to do this. But so. the recreation commission advises recreation department. Okay. The recreation department establishes basically programming for Parks and Recreation Department, and the commission is a very valuable part of that whole process. I'm not saying that value, it's a but process. I'm saying that they don't want to do it, and I, they publicly well, just said then, they don't want to do it. And they would have a negative view that they would be advising the, the Parks and Rec Director, but ultimately the Park and Recreation Department must make the decision. Okay. So then Sean should work with Kenny on next steps to flesh out how this could potentially work. Right, if there's interest in proceeding, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, an analysis, a review, ultimately a proposal that uh, would have to come forward. Okay. Other than that, we are all imposing a program on recreation because recreation would have to be the meaningful player in determining when members of the public could use the pool, under what terms, conditions, et cetera. So, it makes no sense for us to say, oh, well, recreation, you have to do this. Uh, we're not going no, to get not trying to. I, I'm not trying to impose. I, I'm just saying that for this to keep, just to keep, look, to give this its due, you know, to not dismiss it. And I'm not saying you're dismissing it, but I'm saying I don't want this to just go away after one meeting. And so I want it to get really fleshed out. How could it work? There were all the stuff on the slides. All right, what if we, we didn't do that? We didn't do X, but we did Y. And now those are the types of discussions I'm trying to get into. So I, I, I think it's bigger than recreation. I think it's legal. Um, I have no idea how this could work from a public-private perspective. 
you know, the question about what if the Y doesn't raise the rest of the money. I, so I think to me it's, it's, it's almost like it's bigger than just the recreation aspect. Um, recreation's part of it, um, but I'm just trying to give them a place to go after this meeting. And if that's, if it's, if it's the recreation department, I guess that's where they, that's where they go, if that's what you're saying. I, I think it's a responsible proposal for a recreational program. And that, that, the place to start would be with the recreation department. Okay. All right. All right. Well, okay. thank you for your presentation. All right. Thank you guys for uh, all your time tonight. Your great questions as well. And, and uh, have a great night. Thanks, you too. All right. On to item eight, which is a discussion regarding the recreational use of Tyler Mill, uh, presented by Councillor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my apologies to everyone who came for this, but it's this late. Um, basically, the, the reason I'm bringing this topic up is because uh, during, during the pandemic, a lot of people, uh, myself included, um, were looking for outdoor activities uh, that maybe we hadn't uh, participated in the past. And I know hiking and, and visiting uh, local parks and state parks became a big, um, very popular. And, uh, a lot of people have stuck with that and during that time um, I know we had gone to Sleeping Giant a few times we uh, we looked up um, different parks and trails where we might visit during that time and uh, went to different towns and the thought to go to Tyler Mill right in our own backyard never never occurred to me um, so a few months ago or maybe a month ago um, I was invited to for a an informal tour of Tyler Mill, um, went for a, a nice hike on a Saturday morning um, with, with a couple of gentlemen who um, frequent the mill and know a lot about it. Um, we had a great time. Um, I had a great time at least. <laughs> um, it, was, it was beautiful. I had never uh, been that far into the mill and I was re just really taken aback by the beauty of Tyler Mill, um, the diversity of of things that you see there um, from rivers to there's fields and meadows and wildflowers and there's gorges and all, all different um, different types of natural beauty that I, I just didn't even realize was there. Um, <laughs> there were there were two kind of issues that came up during during that visit um, and I started asking questions about about these various issues and um, that's kind of what spurred spurred this agenda item. Uh, one of the issues was I was not aware uh, of the trails. Um, there are really no clear trail maps. Um, I don't think even after being in there now, I don't think I would be comfortable going in there um, to go for a hike without someone who knows Tyler Mill because there's really nothing clearly marked um, that I saw where I would feel comfortable to go in there on a hike and uh, know that I was going to get out where I started or get out at all. <laughs> um, so I, I think the lack of marked trails is an issue. Um, and we would have many more people use it if we had more marked trails. Uh, you know, similar to Sleeping Giant, I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, you go to Sleeping Giant, there's very clearly marked trails. You, you know, you just stay on that one color, you know you're going to get where, you're, where you're, you want to be going. Um, so the, the lack of marked trails was an issue. Um, there was one trail that was was marked okay. Um, I believe it was the pink trail. Um, but then you get to a point on the pink trail, and everything's going great, and then you're in the middle of the mill, and then there's a river, and there's no bridge. And it's not a little creek. It's a pretty substantial, I believe it's the Muddy River. I could be wrong. Um, pretty substantial river. Um, so if you're going through it, you're, of course, we went after a storm. You're, you're basically swimming, or you're at least waist, waist deep, I would say. Or your other option, and you can see the, the trail marker on the other side of the river, your other option is to uh, walk across a fallen tree. It's fairly high. Um, I was asked to go across the tree, and I hesitated and thought it was a joke. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you were to fall off of that while crossing, it's a pretty substantial height. Um, and there's you know rocks in the river below, so really not a safe option. But apparently, that's 
what people do. Um, and so I did, I, I didn't really walk across, I kind of scooted across and there's, I think there's a picture of that somewhere floating around. But, uh, <laughs> and then there was another gentleman with us who was even more hesitant than I was that we had to kind of beg to come across. Um, so anyway, so that's an issue. There's, there should be a bridge there for the, the one trail that I did see marked there's no bridge, and so if you wanted to complete that loop, there's really no option except for this kind of dangerous option to go across. Um, the other issue when I was uh, driving in, so I came in through uh, Northford Road, there's that little parking lot there, and the sign says Tyler Mill, and I always assumed that that's where you had to park. Um, the person I was meeting in there sent me a, a pin on my phone and said, meet me here, you can park here. So I started driving in, and I'm, I'm driving and driving, and I thought I wasn't supposed to be driving that far, because there's really no signs that say that there's a parking lot farther in. Um, so I was thinking I was doing something wrong, I was a little nervous that I was driving that far in, and then sure enough, you get to a, a parking area that's deeper in, but um, I think that's a big issue because I wonder if so many people would never even get that far in because they think that you have to park right by the road, and by the time you walk that distance in, you're not gonna, you know, some people might not keep going to take a hike because, you know, you, you, you've already walked a pretty far distance just to get in. Um, so the lack of signage and letting people know where, where the parking is and how to access um, Tyler Mill, I think, was an issue. Um, the other thing I learned, and um, I guess this is, this is kind of the, the overall uh, takeaway here, I was told that the town of Wallingford bought Tyler Mill using the Land uh, Water Conservation Fund, and it was a grant, and the grant was solely for recreational use. Um, so I, I looked up this, this grant and the fund and why we bought it, and for, from what I can tell, um, when Wallingford purchased Tyler Mill, it was purchased with this grant, and I believe it was a federal grant, um, that said that Tyler Mill is to be used for recreational use uh, forever. So um, if that's true, and it seems like it is, um, while conservation is certainly a, a lofty goal and we all want to conserve, um, I think we can use it for recreation more than we are currently, and also work on conservation uh, efforts in tandem with that. So um, basically the point of this conversation was just to um, maybe let members of the public or um, people interested, the Conservation Commission, I believe, was uh, we invited just to kind of get a conversation out about, you know, maybe we can just use this resource better. We can maybe, um, you know, have better access to trails and just let the public know what a, a gem this is because, you know, I certainly wasn't aware of what, the, what a wonderful resource we have here and I, I just hope that more people are able to use it in the future. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you. So we do have members of the commission here. Um, I moved last spring, but until I moved for 13 years, my where I lived backed up to the Tyler Mill. Um, and I will say that uh, I miss my house a little bit. I miss its location more, although I really like our new location. It was a good move. Um, you know, I... I'm not sure if anybody on the commission can speak to this, but I thought at a certain point um, we had funded uh, a GPS project for the trails. Um, I'm able to find a map on trailforks.com. Um, maybe I was fortunate that I could start at the yellow trail in my backyard and um, had an easy time finding my way around that. I, I know um, for the, the year and a half before we moved, my wife was in there regularly walking our dogs. Um, and I mean, I, she never came back from there telling me that she got horribly lost. But you know, when you start in your backyard, I guess you have a greater likelihood of finding your way home. So if, if you could, sir. I'm John Lathrop. Uh, Vice Chair of the Conservation Commission. And we do have uh, at the entrances to Tyler Mill from uh, Maltby Lane and from uh, Northward Road, there's a, a kiosk with a detailed map. And there have been hand maps 
in a, a box there. The recreation department has maps, and I believe at the library, um, I could uh, give uh, Councilwoman uh, Tata a map tonight, but uh, <clears throat> they are available. And uh, there are, uh, I think, around 15 miles of blazed trails, and they are all clearly marked on the maps, and there are regulations and you know, information on the back of distances. And uh, there are, it's really quite well marked uh, on the blaze trails. The biggest problem we've had in the past few years are uh, people uh, blazing, or not blazing, but uh, cutting new trails that aren't uh, authorized. And in fact, there was a, a trail that uh, I think the biking community had been using that <clears throat> went down a steep slope and it was an a unauthorized trail. And there was a work party, in, including the uh, Quinnipiac uh, big event, uh, volunteer students, and they worked a day out here, out there, to remediate the damage done by that trail and block it off. And, uh, Mr. Parent, if you could please and, refrain, I would appreciate it. And we Thank don't you. know who actually made the trail. But we, uh, to, to intentionally cut and develop new trails is not approved. And the next day, everything was torn out and the trail was, was back open. And it had been, as to our best ability, erased and blocked off uh, in lieu of the, the blazed trails. But that's the only real problem we've had out there. And there's been a great deal of work to maintain trails, and uh, take care of the uh, Tyler Mill area. Um, if there are any questions as far as, you know, which trails, uh, I know you mentioned the pink trail, and that is a concern we've talked about for years, trying to get a bridge across the, the muddy river there, but it's such a wide expanse that the cost has been uh, prohib prohibitive, and when it, uh, the water is down, then it's usually only about uh, 10 inches deep, and there are step stones that some people have taken walking sticks and walked through, but uh, that's probably the only blockage of trail on the, uh, the Tyler Mill Preserve. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions you might have. Um, I do, uh, Councillor Fishbein did want to speak, so before I do go to the public, um, I'm gonna let the council speak. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one of the benefits, if there was ever one, of the pandemic, at least in my family, is, you know, I, I love to hike. I spent a lot of time outdoors as a kid in the woods, overturning rocks and just finding nature. And the pandemic gave me the opportunity to introduce my wife to hiking in the woods. And you know, if you looked at my Facebook page during that period of time when, you know, you really couldn't go anywhere because there were so many restrictions, almost every day we were picking a different trail in this town, and we had a great time. And I, and I have to tell you, you know, I haven't been out there recently, mm -hmm. but I, I think we hit every trail at Tyler Mill, and we were able to, to navigate them. You know, there are resources out there. There's an app called All Trails. Uh, which has some of those on there. There's, um, there's a link, uh, the Wallingford Land Trust uh, actually put together a, a map that has some of the trails. That's, that's handy also, you know, on all, on, on all trails, um, there's quite an array, it looks like a spider web of trails on Tyler Mill. Um, and I know I utilize that a lot. And, and I know when I got to the end uh, I forget which color trail it was, but it's by, you know, Councillor Cervoni's, Chairman Cervoni's home. Uh, I, I Not think, anymore. Well, his old home. I, I just think, remember, there was, a, you know, a placard there with the, the trail, you know, maps that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I really felt proud that uh, we had all of these resources in our town. Um, so, you know, I certainly, you know, I think we should do Trails Day. 
uh, which, you know, I've done um, years past, hasn't been done because of the pandemic and stuff like that, and Trails Day is where we recognize a trail and we'll do it as a council. You know, maybe we'll do Tyler Mill and, and, and do a tour. I know uh, we did that with the Conservation Commission a few years ago, um, and uh, Mary, um, was it Hennessy? Hef uh, Heffernan. Heffernan yep. took us out, and it was, it was fantastic, um, you know, to go out with somebody who's able to identify those that nature and talk about those species um, is such an enriching experience. So, um, you know, whatever you can do to improve it would be great. Mm -hmm. But I just have to tell you from my perspective that I didn't have a problem, I haven't had a problem. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why, as I brought up earlier on, I had no idea what we were talking about here tonight on this agenda item. You know, recreation in Tyler Mill. If we, if I knew we were going to talk about trails, I would have bought you a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, we would have taught. You know, I would have. You know, but well, we're you here. You mentioned uh, looking at uh, trails online. Uh, one of the issues we have is that our official town map <clears throat> of the trails and marked trails is not online. So that the uh, the information people find online is what somebody has put on there and not necessarily the official trails. And we do have blaze trails that go through the property, and we took the time to walk every single inch of the 15 miles of trails with a rolling counter, and every 600 feet, there's a number posted on a tree because uh, there had been an accident in there where somebody was uh, injured, and it took the paramedics, I think, a couple hours to find them. And so now there are numbers every 600 feet on blazed trails only. So that if somebody's injured, they could walk back and with their phone call and say, I'm near 27 on the trail. And the fire department and the police have a copy of the GPS locations of each of those numbers so someone could be uh, rescued more quickly. And I know that, you know, when uh, Mr. Borney would come before us for budget time, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I usually ask, can we do something to enhance a trail or something like that? So, you know, from my perspective, I, I'm all about that. You know, I'll tell you that we were in Tyler Mill late one day and the sun was going down. And my, my wife kept on asking me, why do you keep on looking back? And I didn't want to tell her about bears, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but we made it out okay. Uh, I just, I really enjoy our outdoors and our, our ability in this town. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Parent, I'm going to beg your patience. I'm going to get to you. Um, it's just Anthony Parent, 15, uh, 15, uh, Lincoln Drive. It's been three and a half hours, and you have yet to hear from a recreational user on recreational land. You, you are going to have an opportunity so to be heard. So just to understand, so what commission, you did not identify the commission of which he speaks, though. What commission is what he's speaking for? I know, but please identify for the record. Okay, if you could please have a seat, dial it back a little bit, we'd all be grateful. I have every intention of recognizing you, and I think you understand that. For the benefit of the record, yes. could you better identify the commission? Again, John you Lathrop, I'm vice chair of the Wallingford Conservation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Lathrop. Councillor Zandri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to kind of echo some of Councillor Fishbein's uh, comments. And uh, my favorite trail through there is the Red Trail. I, I, that's the one I'm the most familiar with. The big loop. The, the big red loop there. It comes off of the soccer fields that are up on Center Street if you walk out and through the meadow. Right. And that's actually how I discovered that particular trail. And um, I haven't been there in a couple of years since before the big storm that went through where you guys had to close the, close the property. Um, but I, I recall that a lot of the trees were marked uh, for the blaze trails. You could find the, the markings every, I don't know, 1,000 feet or so on a, on a tree. So I, I, I really like the, um, the ability to get the maps, too. So I, I know where the kiosks are as well. But it, it might be good for the, the commission and for the recreational use, and I'm not really sure the, the remainder of what Councilor Tata wants to bring up is uh, formally, and of course I do want to hear from the people that use it recreationally, um, if there was a way to get those maps uploaded somewhere so we know, so passive people that come by, that only casually walk the area, 
might be able to, to get them so they have them available online. Because I think what's happening now is that there are so many people that are utilizing the, uh, the internet for the access for these trails that, that may or may not be officially blazed. Right, they're getting and, the wrong information. And, and, they, and, you know, again, I don't want to discuss, and I'm going to let the people that, that have a passion to bring this up bring up their, their ideas and their thoughts. And I understand the, the need to keep certain areas away, people away from certain areas because there's all kinds of um, plants and animals that cannot be disturbed in there. But I think part of the problem is People don't know. A, a, a casual person that's going to use the GPS coordinates and walk through and they're going to see an area and they're not going to know whether or not this is an area that they, they could be on, should be on, or shouldn't be on. And this goes, this goes even a level beyond the conservation piece. It's, it's like what you just pointed out, the safety piece. Someone slips and hurt, even something minor like twisting an ankle, if they're on the wrong part of the property, it's, it's very difficult for emergency services to find them. Exactly. So I'm kind of hoping that, you know, with this discussion today, that we might be able to get some more formal documentation that we might be able to upload or post somewhere, town website, wherever. Um, I know that there, there are, uh, the Open Space Commission has maps too. Mm -hmm. So anything that would be helpful. Well, one, one thing that most people carry a cell phone and at the kiosks, there's a large map with the trails, and it's, it's quite common for people to take a good screenshot of the, the large map on their phone, and they have it handheld with them on the trails. And if you're on a blazed trail, then you can very easily find your way by a colored trail, and uh, it's much, much safer. And uh, those are the major trails that, that we had, uh, quite a few years ago, had a... a an outdoor company come in and suggest which trails to keep and which trails minor links to, to maybe drop off, and they blazed uh, the main trails that are the, the most, uh, it gives you the, the best view of the whole park, but in some of them are loops and some of them go straight through, but uh, they're, they're well blazed. No, I and, and I acknowledge that because, like, and as I mentioned, like I said, the the red loop's my favorite because I think that one is more heavily traveled, so therefore it stays pretty open throughout yep. the year. So, um, thank you very much for your work. I'm interested to hear what the what the uh, recreational users have to say, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you. Before I go out to the public, anyone else on the council? Thank you. No, Mr. Parent. Thank you for your patience. If you could get closer to the mic, please. Ken Rowe, oh, not that close. <laughs> thank you. Ken Rowe, Pine River Road, Wallingford. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all for um, the intent to purchase the property to complete the parcel there at Tyler Mill. I know it's a lot of work. It sounds like it at least with 10 people that you have to deal with the states and whatnot on. So thank you for going through that for something that's really important to the parcel and for uh, all of us. So um, just want to make a few comments. So I moved here uh, for Tyler Mill. Um, bought a house back and right up to the property. I love it. I go out there every day. It's beautiful. Um, I've done a little bit of research on it as a result of my time there. And what I found was um, that the town, back in the 70s, had the foresight to purchase this property. And what they did with it, the way they did this is they used a federal land water conservation fund grant, which is basically something where every time there's an oil and gas offshore drilling permit, money goes into a fund, and that money can only be used uh, for purchase of land for outdoor recreation. I'm gonna quote one thing in here. Land Water Conservation Fund, acted in 1965, was enacted to assist in preserving, developing, and assuring accessibility to all citizens of the United States of America, of present and future generations and visitors who are lawfully present within the boundaries of the United States. Such quality and quantity of outdoor recreation resources as may be available and are necessary and desirable for individual active participation in such recreation and to strengthen the health and vitality of the citizens of the United States. So the message of that is that any land purchased under the Land, Water, and Conservation Fund Act funding is forever locked in for the purpose of outdoor recreation. Tyler Mill falls into that, as does several other parcels uh, that are in the open space bucket within the town. So 
we know that Tyler Mills is a recreation property. We also know it's conservation. There's thousands of acres of nature out there. It's amazing. That's what we all want to go back there for, to be part of nature. We're part of nature too. Um, if that land wasn't purchased with that recreation grant, there is no question that would be a housing development. If that recreation money was not applied, this would not be recreation land, it would not be conservation land. In fact, you might be living there. What's the point? Why are we here today? So what I'd like to see is recognition of Tyler Mill as, recognition of the purpose of Tyler Mill as for outdoor recreation. It's not up to the town to decide that, it was decided with the purchase. When we took the $807,000 from the federal government, we're bound by the obligations of that. And that locks in the purpose, primary purpose, as outdoor recreation. It's not for conservation, it's not for farming, it's outdoor recreation, period. Doesn't mean we can't have other secondary interests, but right now, the land is being managed with conservation as the primary interest, and recreation as secondary. That goes against the charter, it goes against the intent, it goes against that federal law that we signed on to when we took that money. What I'd like to see is us refocus Tyler Mill. Welcome to Tyler Mill. It's for outdoor recreation. Let's treat it as such. Let's set up management over the trail system that's focused on outdoor recreation. It's a conflict of interest to have the Conservation Commission over the recreation trails and the trail maps. Those trails were identified in a 2011 DEEP Recreational Trails Programs grant. Ferrucci and Wilicki did the work, yeah, great. The state paid for it with a rec grant. The purpose of that rec grant and the purpose of that program within the state is not to narrow access. They would never have agreed to narrow access with that $48,000. Mind you, this is on a parcel of property that's probably worth $150 million. So a $48,000 grant Shouldn't be able to mutate the intent of that. It can't, LWCF won't let it. Those trails and the output of those trails in 2011 were recorded, blazed, and put in the map that's in the kiosk. Here's the problem. That's not the trail system. Go back there. It covers some of the trails. It covers the ones that that committee, with no public input and no public review, decided should be the trails. And that's where all the conflict lies with this land. The Conservation Commission believes that only those blazed trails or where people should go. And that is not the actual trail system. Trail forks, those apps that you all said we need to get it out there on. The Conservation Commission removed trails from that and asked them to be removed. I don't want to pick on anyone. I don't want to you know, diminish the really good work that they do with invasives and some of the other areas. What I want to see is more of a focus on recreation and I want to see us recognize that that's what the property is intended for and that's what we're obligated to use it for. Thank you. Mr. Parent. Thank you. Anthony Parent, Lincoln Drive. Um, one of the things that we need to consider is what is conversion of recreation land? This land is not really the town's land. And one of the things that Kenny Michaels does is he tells non-town residents, ah, oh, we don't want your opinion. Big no-no. Big no-no. This grant is for anyone who is in the United States legally. The grant is something that the town council controls under the charter. This is for anyone, Tyler Mill is a recreation area for anyone legally in the United States, whether you're on a visa or just traveling. That's what it's here for. That is what's specific for it. So putting it into the town isn't exactly right. It's really not. The town is a custodian of the land is a better way to do it. And the thing is that the town can do other things with the land other than recreation However, there is a process that needs to be filed, and it's in the, it's in the uh, congressional reporter. It regards conversion, and essentially, it's my understanding that you, th this board has signed uh, farm leases that are on land that are on Tyler Mill. Is that correct? Um, as I sit here, I'm not sure they go into the Tyler Mill. There's some that are in and in, 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 there are some parcels that are on Tyler Mill and some that are not. I, I know they... I'm familiar with parcels that border the edge. Mayor, are there, are, are, do we have farm leases on the Tyler Mill as part of the Tyler Mill land? Along Tamarack Swamp Road, I think there are some. Yeah. Well, there, there's a big, there's a big, um, there's a big tractor hanging um, on the Pink Trail. So somebody's doing that. That's also in Tyler Mill. So at least there's three, there's at least three fields. That, and I believe also veterans, the, the field at veterans, there's a field at veterans that we were told not to ride mountain bikes on. That's least a is that where the community garden is? Yeah, on, on the, uh, with the, the part, um, 
at East Center Fields, the back parking lot as it goes into Tyler Mill. There's a field up there and then there's another field on the side. Those are part of Tyler Mill as well. It's my understanding. Those leases, I believe, are illegal. You guys don't have the authorization to do that. That land is for recreation. You can't take recreation land and lease it out to agriculture. That's a total no-no. Unless, again, you file the procedures. Now, I could go through the procedures with you, but you're not even, you know, I think you guys would know, you're not even close. It, it's sort of a, it, it kind of goes on for, for many pages about what's required. And one of the things that's required when you take land away from recreational users is you have to find a substitute. So if you're gonna take our land away for recreation, where's our substitute? Now, I think Ken's calculations are right. Tyler Mill is something worth about $150 million. In fact, there is no substitute for Tyler Mill. That's it. So by taking your leases, you guys have done something, I think, quite illegal that you might want to revisit. Now, I'll be honest, those farmers, a lot of them do a lot of good things because we have a lot of invasives growing. Uh, one of the fields that they're allowing to run follow is just nothing but Japanese barberry and autumn olive um, near one of the commissioner's house that she allowed to burn down and, and have a bunch of debris and poison into the watershed, and that's sort of what they don't want. The Conservation, Conservation Commission exists for one reason, to restrict access at Tyler Mill while doing enough to justify their existence. The reason why is the mayor, uh, 21 years ago I was on the Conservation Commission as a user, and the mayor back then told me that, well, you know, you're really not allowed here. I wasn't made to be welcome, and in fact I was chased off of the commission because I kept on adding suggestions for improvements after improvements, and it was shot down again and again, and there's mysterious forces. We could never quite identify that got in the way. Don't they always do that? They seem to do that. So the fact is for years we have been not told the truth about this, and we have been pushed out of Tyler Mill. The use is down, and now one of the things, one of the people, this is what they have done. They removed a trail from the trail forks. So imagine this, you're lost in Tyler Mill. Is it the next trail or not? Well, it's not blazed. What does that mean? Removing trails from a trail system is reckless. If you're so concerned about people getting lost, make sure everything's blazed, shouldn't you? Or you should control the trails, shouldn't you? I'd ask you to direct your uh, comments right, to right. the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Parent. The fact is this is all wrong. Everything here is wrong. Recreational users have been kicked out and abused, abused. If the plans that were followed back when 20 years ago, here's, I got a quote that just, that, that really, was really, I think this speaks to, because you know what, a lot of things sort of, I'm hearing a lot of things, and I don't come to these meetings a lot, because they kind of go on a bit, appreciate your. How will Wallingford use its purchased open spaces? Mr. Dickinson said that the land bought through state grants cannot be improved in any way, which is not true, correct? Would that be true or not true? I don't know the context in which that was spoken. You certainly are not able to build structures. You're not supposed to put playing fields with- On recreational with, uh, land. Uh, uh, you, on, what, what did you talk about? The well, um, well, I would say, and I would say in all fairness, there's this, let me continue because this includes both parcels of land. The town cannot turn them into playing fields or golf courses, for instance. In the, short in the short term, he would like to work out some kind of lease plans with the farmers. For the long term, he said, he envisioned the town making inventories of the land's special features and then developing a vision of what the town would like them to be. 100 years from now, the Tyler Mill will be Wallingford Central Park, he predicted. Well, we only got 79 years left because he said that in the year 2000. These are things that are always promised to us. And when, it, when, I, and when I read this, I gotta say, when I read this, I remember reading this, this, this back when. When I read that, I, I said, 100 years from now, the Tyler Mill will be Wallingford Central Park, he predicted. I remember voting for him again and again because he did that. But he didn't mean it. He didn't mean any of it. Because what he's done is he's restricted ASIC by putting some of the most toxic people imaginable on the Conservation Commission. I went to one meeting where Diane Saunders said this out loud. We have a nest, enough testosterone in the room. I brought that to the mayor's attention. The mayor then had her sign a very lame apology to me because she apologized to no, no one else. The mayor knew this happened and he allowed her to serve. What does it say about us? I coach a cross country team. What if I said to the girls, hey, hey girls, we got too much estrogen here. 
Come on. This is a place that's supposed to be open for everybody, and you're, you're beating up on the hardest workers? This is not open. This is not reflecting well at all of our town. And it's illegal, too. So we might want to start changing how we look at this and value recreational users first and primary. That is what's required. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, if you would, name an address for the record, please. Hello, my name is Joseph Robles. I'm 45 Northford Road, which happens to be 200 yards from the entrance of Tyler Mill. I moved here 26 or 27 years ago. Part of the reason I moved here was for Tyler Mill. I was living in Northford, discovered some mountain bike trails, loved it. I was a surgical intern at St. Raphael's Hospital. I worked at Bristol Hospital. I now work in Middletown. I never want to leave this community. I like Wallingford. I love Tyler Mill. My wife walks there three, four days a week. I ride their mountain bikes quite a bit. And for years, there was no issue. 25 years ago, that place was a wasteland. There was abandoned cars. There was abandoned pets. I, there was a grand piano that was abandoned there. Two weeks ago, there was a mattress there. This place has always been a wasteland. There was the history of the place is very sketchy. I think a bunch of years ago, people discovered it, started to use it. Um, the mountain bike community got very active. It was very in its infancy, and it was one of the premier places to mountain bike in the 80s and 90s. Then they had big races. They were like one of the biggest races in New England, sponsored through NEMBA. I think our rec department helped out with that. We had a gem here. We had a beautiful mountain bike place. That being said, I would ride there all the time, and after the race, the place was a shit show. There was stuff everywhere. I was not that big a fan of how that went down. I think soon afterwards, I think the Conservation Commission got involved, and I think they, be, they turned the opposite direction. Um, I had some kids. I got busy in my career and stuff, so I was not there for much a bunch of years ago. I think a lot of has happened. A lot of other parcels have been purchased. I've gotten back into it. I've been out there quite a bit. I know every inch of the, the place because I live adjacent to there. I'm there four days a week on my bike. And I've done some research also, like Mr. Roback here, uh, and I've looked into some of the database that the town actually has. The town has this big open space map. They have all these little dots with numbers saying, oh, we bought, we bought this then. We, bought, we used this much money from this grant. We used this much from this. A huge portion of that not just the original portion, a lot of that was bought with grant money. And then this database that someone who preceded Aaron O'Hare, who was the environmental planner or whatever, had this database, and I think part of the reason she had this database because if you get grant money, you have to have an open space committee, you have an open space plan, you have to have a 10-year plan. It seems to me that has lapsed I think there's a lot of money on the table that we are not taking advantage of because we're no longer doing this. I think that's, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, it's a little puzzling to me, but this on this database, on this spreadsheet, I had them print, I went to town hall, I had them for 11 bucks, I had to pay for this huge map. I got all these spreadsheet and it says, okay, this, this is who runs this, who's, who's managing this property, uh, how much money did we spend how much money did we get from grant money? Did we get grant money? Did we not get grant money? There was one little footnote that said, across from Tyler Mill, up on the hill, across East Center Street, there's this piece of land, and the comment was, does anyone even know this exists? So here we bought land, probably with grant money, and it was for open space, but no one uses it. So this is not just solely because of Tyler Mill. There's a piece of land between Scarred Road and George Washington, three parcels of land they purchased. On this database it says, yeah, surrounded with barbed wire and there's no trespassing sands. That was bought with grant money that was supposed to guarantee access. I do see hunters there. I don't see much access for that. And I, I don't know who's managing this. I think 
these open spaces probably need to be managed through a group of people, group of users. And I went to the open space meeting earlier this year. Partially the reason I went to this is because my impression is the Conservation Commission was getting very antagonistic towards mountain biking community, not just certain individuals that are getting, they were proposing a total ban on mountain bikes. And that's what the minute said. So I went to some meetings. I was treated rather poorly. I brought my wife, who has an environmental master's degree. She was told she could not speak. The, the previous chairperson treated her very poorly. And I was actually very embarrassed to be a member of this community and have my wife being treated that way, who has more credentials than anyone on that committee. That being said, I just kept a low profile, went to the Open Space Committee, which Ken, Kenny Michaels organized. I wanted to be proactive. And Kenny Michaels realized, I think, after he heard all this grant stuff, and knowing the history with the previous um, Parks and Recs commissioners, he realized that this probably should be in the hands of recreation. Unfortunately, there's probably some history that the Trails Committee, which is actually just a subcommittee of the Conservation Commission, kind of dictates what, what can be used and what cannot be used, which is kind of a conflict of inference, because I understand their ideas to conserve, restrict. We want this land to go back to nature. There's huge portions of Tyler Mill that there's reclaimed tar on trails, because there used to be asphalt trails there. There's junk in the woods. There's a, t there's a tire dump, which hopefully you're purchasing, and we're going to clean this up. This is not you know, piping plover uh, habitat. This is not, this is land that should be kept natural, kept beautiful. There should be more recreation use in this area. Kenny Michaels has kind of started getting some people, the horse users, the trail users. Uh, I've gotten inv involved with him kind of in the, in the exploring this as a possibility to get multiple users, not just the mountain bike people, not the Conservation Commission, not just the dog walkers. He wants to get everyone who has skin in the game. There's huge portions of this park, like Bertini Park, which is not even used, which the town bought, and there used to be a YMCA camp there. That's, it's, it's a wasteland. It's wasted, and I think the Conservation Commission is happy with just keeping it totally natural. It needs to be used as recreation. I could go on and on. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kenny Michaels if he's here. Is he? He's here. We met last week. We met with some other people, uh, some people who have experience with the Conservation Commission, and they kind of see it our way also. One of the people who was invited was a horse equestrian user. She's from Meriden. You know what? She's from Meriden, but the land grant says you can be from anywhere. So I think that's good that we're getting people from outside. And to address some of these issues with these, these apps, no one's taking pictures of trail maps and using that anymore. People are using apps, they're using trail forks, using all, all trails. And, and the Conservation Commission is trying to take trails that have been there. There's a trail that a, an Eagle Scout made 25 years ago. They don't want that to be a trail because it didn't, whatever in this grant that these people picked these trails, they said, no, that can't be a trail. And some poor Eagle Scout who grew up in this community put, put his heart and soul into this trail. It's, it's, it's supposed to not be there. And that was taken off trail for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Michaels, you are the director of Parks and Recs. You can sit at that table. You've suffered to earn the privilege. It's like melanoma without the pills. Just, Just for the record, remind us who you are. Sure. Kenny Michaels, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, so I, I guess what, to echo what, what Joe had said, so in May we do an annual open space users meeting, and at that meeting we invite, geez, there, there's got to be about 20 to 25 people. The mayor attends. Uh, we have the police department there, and, and we talk annually about what, what goes on in open space, not just Tyler Mill, but open space in general. What issues are we going on, you know, are we dealing with? Um, what do we see going on out there? And it kind of gives everybody an open forum to air their grievances or, or solve any problems that we may have. 
from that meeting, the general consensus, predominantly from the mountain bike community, was to have a Tyler Mill, Tyler Mill users group, similar to how we have a field users group for our sports leagues. So we actually kicked off the first meeting last week prior to hunting season um, to get a representative from the mountain bike community, which was Joe Robles. Um, we had Scott Gray, who represents the stewards of Tyler Mill, uh, Linda Thomas, who was representing the horseback riders, and Bill Holroyd was invited, but he could not attend. Uh, he would represent the hunting community. Um, and that gives an avenue for people to talk about ideas, what they see, what's going on. The elephant in the room is the mountain bike community is not happy with the current trail system in place. Um, there's existing trails within Tyler Mill, as Mr. Robles explained, that are 25, 30, 35, 40 years old, but were not put into the this, this sanctioned trail map for whatever reason. It was prior to, to me even coming here. Um, at the open space users meeting in May, we said it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that if they made a presentation that we could explore their ideas for trails to be either added or extended um, as long as we go through the proper channels and procedures to make sure that we're doing the right thing by adding these trails. Um, hopefully with this Tyler Mill users group meeting, as we take baby steps and we're in the infancy of it, that will come into play where these ideas can be put to paper and maybe the mountain bikers who are looking to add a trail come with a proposal, we walk the site, and then if we have to go through planning and zoning or, or inlands and wetlands to see if it is feasible and if it can be a trail that we can add, then we would explore it. And that, that's all it's, it's coming down to. Um, I, I'm really much playing the liaison between these groups to, to see what they need. What, what's going on out there? What can we do? What, what are they seeing? Um, you don't look that bad for the wear. <laughs> thank you. I'm getting gray. But, Please don't. <laughs> um, so that, that's where we are. Um, you know, it's, it's always the ongoing battle of the existing trails that have been there outside of the trail system that people like to use and, and want to ride their bikes. And those trails sometimes will get mapped on trail forks, which aren't the sanctioned trails in the Tyler Mill trail system. Um, so as we move along, you know, those proposals can come to the table, and that's why we started this, this users group. Dr. Robles, if, if you want to speak, I'm going to ask you to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I appreciate that um, the position you've taken in light of what's going on, and, and hopefully we can work through the controversy. Councillor Testa. I'm almost afraid to bring this up, but where do motorized vehicles come into play? Because it seemed to me that I've heard a lot of, a lot of rumblings over time that ATVs, motocross, well, is that even a separate discussion? Is that even a problem anywhere? What, or is to, that another discussion? To allow access? Or is it a problem on our, in our open space areas? And are we talking about different trails, different groups? Well, they're, they're, they're not authorized in the mill or in open space. Is it, a, is it an ongoing problem? I, I wouldn't say it's an ongoing okay. problem. I think it's cyclical. Um, I know during the winter the snowmobiles do go in there. And there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah. You know. But um, to say if it's a constant issue, I, I, I don't think it is. I right, good. I'm, I'm only asking because we're talking about this tonight, and, and people are asking us to formulate some type of opinion at some point. So I want to make sure I've got the, the interested parties straightened out. Sure. That's all. So we're talking about mountain bikers. We're not talking about people that want to ride No, no, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's, the authorized, group, right? it's the authorized users of Tyler Mill. So the hikers, the mountain bikers, okay. the, the, the walkers, the, I got the horseback riders. Okay. Which I know is, is 
it's enough of a challenge to, to work out. We're not talking about anything with motors. Okay, engines, good enough. Nope. They're not allowed. They're not. All right. Correct. Good enough. Unless you're making a push for it. Oh, I never remember. You all set? Councilor Marone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So real quick, I, I guess I'm trying to understand. So this is like a, um, this reminds me of the Historic Properties Commission thing. And as it, we, we delved deeper into that, I found out there was all this backstory that I wasn't aware of. So I, I guess I'm trying to understand, what is the Conservation Commission's role in this at all? So, so they oversee the, the trail maintenance, um, you know, after storm cleanup, the trail markers, you know, making sure that the invasives aren't growing into the trail system. Um, they're, they're like really with the eyes and ears out in the mill. We don't have park rangers. You know, we don't have somebody that's a Tyler Mill overseer. So I think back in 2014 or, or 2013, I think is when the Conservation Commission came about. And that was their role between the stewards, of the, and, the stewards and the commission to oversee what goes on in Tyler Mill. Okay, but, but so for the day-to-day -day operation, if you will, of the park, that's under, overseen by your department, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have a request for one more member from the public to speak. I'm going to allow it. It's kind of unusual at this point, but if you could go ahead and then we'll hear from Representative Mashinsky and we'll wrap this I'll up. I'll be brief. Ken Rowe, Pine River Road again. Uh, just a comment on maintenance of the park. So there is a Stewards of Tyler Mill Group under the Conservation Commission. They do some projects on the park. The day-to-day -day maintenance and keeping the trails open is continuous. If, you, if there's any storm, a storm that, you know, your yard gets wet, your trees shake, and there's some sticks in your yard, multiply that times 1,600 plus acres, and every single trail is blocked. It's the user group that's doing that. No one's waiting for stewards of Tyler Mill or anything. There's a little bit of uh, kind of ambiguity there in that trail users aren't allowed to help clear the trails, but the reality is if they didn't, every single trail would be closed after every storm until the next storm. So that's something we're looking to resolve with the trail group um, to make sure that we have the ability for people to do maintenance and to do it on the books if we can. Uh, Representative Mashinsky, please. Uh, Mary Mashinsky, 188 South Cherry. And uh, like, like Representative Fishbein, I too am a regular user of Tyler Mill. And uh, I also remember back when um, Mayor Bamako bought it. It was bought originally for possible future water supply. It was bought from a water company. And he thought that Maybe 50 years out, we might need it for water supply. But in the meantime, it would be a uh, outdoor recreation area. And it is. It's used for hunting. It's used for fishing. There's trout fishing there. There's hikers. There's bird watchers. In the pandemic, I was going there almost every day for about 45 minutes a day for exercise and looking at the animals and so on. And... Um, had no trouble with the trail directions at all because if you take the map with you, you're, you're set. So, Councillor Tata, just, just bring that map. I have a laminated one and I just bring it and then uh, I can find my way out easily. But anyway, the, um, this, is, this is like a, uh, this is a management challenge because there are so many types of recreation, not just one. It's not just mountain bikers, but it's all different types of folks go out there for various reasons. And if a mountain bike trail is cut without any pre-planning by a couple of aficionados of mountain biking, then they may, as is, as is true today, there is a trail, a new trail cut through Hemlock Grove with lady slippers, which is a very rare plant that's disappearing in our state. And the choice of putting it there means that someone else that walks out there to look at lady slippers and birds will not see what they came to see. So they lose out on their recreation because somebody decided to do their own thing without checking with the other users of the parcel. So Kenny is right. It's the, all the users have to work with each other so that one use doesn't destroy the use of another type of recreation person. And I myself 
Representative Testa, Councillor Testa, you had asked about the motorized bikes. I've been buzzed by them several times, uh, six at a time on the trails. They're not supposed to be there. It says in black and white on the sign, no motorized vehicles, but they're out there. And that, if you're out there to look at uh, barred owls or something, then the mountain bikers driving, the, uh, excuse me, the motorized bikes chasing you off the trail is not going to make that person happy who's out there to look at the barred owls. So if you're cutting a trail and causing erosion into the muddy river, which is happening now out there, the trout fishermen have a hard time catching trout because now there's sediment in the muddy river, which is a, otherwise a very clean river. So I guess Kenny's problem is he's got to get all these recreation people together at the table, and they can't just make their own decision without considering the other users They've really got to share this very wonderful resource and uh, not cause another recreation uh, user to lose out on their recreation. So that, that's really, that's really uh, what has to be done. And people that cut their own trails without checking with the other users are really being unfair to the other users. It's, it's supposed to be for the whole town. It was a future water supply. And currently, many types of recreation users all share that parcel together. So as one of them who's here, and my son is a mountain biker, I hope that uh, we will find a way to share without destroying some of the other features of that, of that recreation area. And, and Counselor Tad, I'd love to go hiking with you anytime you want to go. Thank you. That's actually what I want to finish on. Well. I could. <laughs> We've exceeded our public comment time, but since you've been cooperative with me. I have been cooperative. Um, I think uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes. Uh, Anthony Perrin, once again, uh, I think one of, the, one of the things is this place is massive, 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 massive. And we're asking, you guys control it. You guys, I look at the charter, you guys are controlling it. I think I've been hearing people saying they're enjoying things. When was the last time you were really there? Why don't we go this weekend? You guys control it. Let's go this week. I'll give you a tour. And I'll give you a tour of the of the trail that I bypassed because of the erosion into Muddy River because it did destroy the streams. That's a bypass. That was an illegal quad trail that was made in 19, 2001, and that was what they blazed. They blazed an illegal quad trail. I remember when the quad went up there, this off camber thing, and it's eroded all the way down and it right into the muddy river, which is a class A double stream. And because it's not safe to be on, I created a reroute that followed all the, all the correct protocols. And I know what Lady Slipper looks like and I didn't touch it. And that's why I did the reroute because the trail that you guys use is completely wrong, unsafe, and not environmentally friendly. And that's the point I've been trying to bring up this entire time. There's not any one of us mountain bikers who isn't a conservationist. That's what we are. That's why we're there. And in that spirit, let's go for a tour together. Instead of being in here where we're getting, I'm getting passionate about this, I could show you it. I yeah. could show you it, and you can make your determination to say, is Anthony crazy? Or, oh, he's kind of got a point. And so I would say that would be our best course of action. And if you can't make if you can't make a tour, because look, we can't do it all in one day. If you can't make a tour, then you gotta think to yourself, well, are you really adequately able to supervise this? If you can't even go in there to see what it is, and well, someone's saying this and someone's saying that, I'll happily show you around, I'll happily show everyone around. What trails came in when, what trails were illegal, what trails I had permission to build, which ones I didn't, which ones were built, which ones they blazed, even though I built it illegally. Um, I could give you the tour of everything, um, and I think that would be a really helpful thing for everybody to understand. Yep, we can't have a quorum there because then it has to be a meeting. So you'll get small groups. Small groups, I'd love to give small yep. groups to everybody. Um, Thank you. Saturday morning we could do it. I know it's campaign season, but look, this is your responsibility. This is a recreation grant that came to you. You have to do this. And I think we also have to take a look at all those leases. Those leases are not legal. It can't be. I mean, how could that be legal? I guess we'll find out. Okay, well, what's the next step on that? It's a good question. We'll have the law department look at them. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. 
Ms. Saunders, you, you're not making the record by sitting in your chair. You're welcome to go, Diane Saunders, Northward Road. You're welcome to go any time except this weekend is opening of hunting season. So please, if you want a mountain bike story, hunters can give them to you. When they have a bead on a bird and a mountain bike comes flying over their back as they're taking their shot, that happened. So please Thank don't come this Saturday. Thank you Thank for you. Uh, warning us. Mayor. Uh, I just, I think the effort to bring everyone together, talk about what new trails there should be, um, how to manage the area is all very appropriate. But I think there's another thing that has to be emphasized, and that is that unless you are authorized to have power equipment or other brush cutting equipment in there, you should not be doing anything, period. If you want to do something, then you need to contact the responsible people, and this, this point would be primarily Kenny Michaels, and get permission, because that is dedicated to recreational use. It's dedicated to also being managed by some entity, and that falls on the town of Wallingford. So the town of Wallingford has to set the rules and try to balance the issues that allow everyone to enjoy it. We just cannot allow anyone to be in there doing whatever they want. And I'll give you an example. It was in the 70s, I believe, the town decided that people could go in and cut firewood. So they were gonna clear a certain area, some of the understory, whatever. And you could, it was an auction, and you, you uh, picked a ticket and you got a certain area that you could cut firewood. That had to be ended. It created such a mess with people going in there. They saw other people cutting things, so I guess you can cut anything. It became absolutely uncontrollable, and it brought an end to that whole approach. So we really have to be careful about who can be out there cutting, and it has to only be a person with permission who's authorized. Otherwise, if anyone can do it, anyone will, and we will lose much of what we regard as a gem and a pristine area. But I do think the effort to bring people together, certainly there can be new trails planned, but it's got to be planned and approved. And then it's fine, no, no problem. And there has to be an open mind, and Kenny, you're the guy, an open mind to balance the various interests listen to what has to be done, and do this in a very methodical, balanced way. I, I think we all benefit from that. But no one, no one should be shut out, but nor should anyone be taking advantage of the fact that we don't have guards every 50 feet out there to police it. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mr. Chairman, I sort of feel like I'm the arbitrator in a dispute and the parties have not told me what the hell the dispute is about. You know, I got an agenda item here. I heard earlier on that there was some talk about banning mountain bikes. I, you know, I don't even know procedurally how that would even happen. Um, you know, there's passion, there's friction. There's nothing before us. So I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out I'd love to see a great trail system out there. You know, perhaps if the decision is made to have a particular trail for mountain bikers, you know, maybe that makes sense. I don't want to say that that much, you know, because somebody else is going to make that decision. Can we all just play nice? <laughs> Can we all just get along? Um, I like that as the final word. Yeah, that's, I just, you know, if you need our help or my help, please let me know. But I got no idea what's going on here, so thank you. <laughs> Mr. Michaels, thank you for coming forward. Um, I, as, as you and I do, and talk with, do talk with some regularity, you and I will continue to talk about this. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. With that, and there being no further business on the agenda, I will gladly entertain a motion to adjourn. Please, God, adjourn. Second. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, we're locking you out.